بسم الله الرحمن الرحيم آه والصلاة والسلام على رسول الله نبينا محمد وعلى آله وصحبه وسلم آه Dear audience, respected speaker Welcome to the second uh, day of the Jordan Clinic as Health Service uh, course which organized by Preventive Medicine Office at Jordan Health Network uh, Yesterday we started uh, the journey together with our particular speaker uh, who taught us in a long journey uh, about the trouble she faced the trouble during uh, the trouble and also they explore what are the immunization and the chemical plexes which is required for, uh, for the traveler uh, hopefully you will enjoy with us inshallah uh, for the second day of the course uh, we will start now inshallah with our first uh, speaker for today Victoria Sumayama a consultant pulmonologist who will present to us about the airborne uh, disease during travel. Uh, welcome, Dr. Sumaya. You can proceed, please. Assalamu alaikum. Sabah al khair, everyone. Uh, I will start. My presentation uh, is about uh, airborne disease during travel. As we all know, the airborne disease is the most common disease uh, traveler can get uh, during uh, traveling because it is easiest uh, to transmit and it is easiest to get the infection during the coughing or sneezing or even talking. Uh, but on the same time, it is easy to prevent by immunization and the simple measure of infection control uh, measure, like of etiquette, hand hygiene, safety distance, and mask. Uh, there is many airborne organisms, uh, which it can be virus or uh, bacterial or uh, even fungi. There is so many, I will go through the very important because of the time, I will not go, uh, go through all. Um, the vaccine, can reduce the chance of getting airborne for many of uh, that respiratory disease, like chickenpox, diphtheria, influenza, measles, mumps, TB, and whooping cough. Uh, it can reduce the getting to getting infection and reduce complication also. Uh, traveler can get the, the disease, uh, respiratory disease, or can acquire the, the, the respiratory disease. Depend on the risk of infection, as mentioned by Dr. Amna yesterday. Uh, depend on the travel characteristic and traveler themselves and destination. That's why pre-travel health consultation and vaccine minimize this risk to get the infection. The risk of infection will start from the travel itself, depend on the duration of the travel and the mode of transport. I choose uh, the aircraft as it is the most common uh, people uh, taking to travel from country to country. And as we noticed uh, in the last epidemic or the recent epidemic, uh, COVID-19, the spread, most of the spread from country to country by travel. I will start by aircraft uh, environment to see the risk of getting infection from the aircraft itself. Nowadays, our commer uh, commercial uh, cabins is pressurized system. That means we can control ventilation, it can control desired uh, pressure and control temperature from 18 to 30 and humidity from 10 to 20 and air exchange on uh, at least 20 times. That's exactly what we are using in the hospital in the theater and isolation room. This pressurization system starts when the aircraft altitude from uh, 4,000 to 8,000 up to 30,000 to 4 to 40,000. This is the aircraft. I will go through the ventilation of the aircraft to see if there is uh, infection. Uh, the air uh, inside the craft is depend on 50% air fresh and 50% recirculating from the air inside the cabinet. But it is, uh, say, uh, it is designed that the air coming from the seat, the recirculated air, will go down, will not spread during the craft. 
the cabinet. We'll go down in directly and exhaust it through the exhaust fan, going to the uh, high efficacy HEPA filter, then going to the engine of the craft, and the very, very high pressure. It reached 2,750 kilopascal, and it's heated to very high temperature up to 8,000, which is enough to kill any pathogen. Actually, it is killing 99.79%. Uh, then it will go through the uh, cooling to the, through the air conditioning unit and go back to the uh, pipe to distribute the air. This cycle going every two to three, uh, two to three minutes. So that the filtration of the air, uh, two to three minutes, every two to three minutes. Uh, that is minimize the risk of getting infection. In spite of that, the risk of infection can increase by close contact. If there is any infectious traveler, uh, this risk will be due uh, through two row around the index. And also by the due, it's affected by the duration of the journey. Uh, the longest the journey, the risk is be higher. Uh, the transmission, as we said, uh, it is less, but we can decrease this uh, transmission uh, by detection of a braille person in the airport before travel. This is, will minimize the risk of further infection. So the aircraft, the transmission is less, but in spite of that, it can, uh, it can be risk of infection depend on the close contact, the infectiousness of the traveler, and the duration of travel. It can be reduced by uh, detection of any febrile person. That is why the screening of poor traveler can minimize the risk of uh, infection. The most or the largest respiratory outbreak, and the latest one is the COVID-19, uh, and still it is going on. I will not go through it because there is a detailed presentation by Dr. Ibrahim it will be next, I think. So I will skip it. I will go to pulmonary disease, pulmonary tuberculosis, and uh, it is all disease. And in spite of all the effort to end this TB, still it is a uh, uh, public health threat. Uh, it is very common all the world with concentration on uh, Africa and Asia. Uh, tuberculosis is caused by mycobacterium tuberculosis and it is preventable and treatable. The most contagious or infectious uh, pulmonary TB is uh, pulmonary with cavity and laryngeal TB. The mycobacterium uh, tuberculosis, it will go, it will enter the body through the respiratory system, through the nose or the mouth, going down to the trachea and going to the small bronchioles, settle down in the alveolar. In the alveoli, because it is the most irritated area uh, in the lung, from here either to cause pulmonary tuberculosis or by infiltration to the blood going to cause systemic tuberculosis or uh, to go to other organ and, uh, and uh, make or cause uh, uh, other cerebral pulmonary uh, tuberculosis. In the lung itself, either to cause latent TB or to cause TB disease. The difference between latent TB, this is depend on the immunity of the person. Uh, if the person immunity is uh, high, uh, the mycobacterium tuberculosis will be encapsulated and they stay inside the lung, will not cause any symptom, will not uh, be infectious to others, and will not spread from person to person. But later on, if the immunity is low, can, uh, can, tra can transfer to be uh, active disease and can infect the others. And the other one, either from the start, it will grow inside the lung and 
making symptom and making pulmonary disease and be highly infectious and uh, can cause even this if not treated. What is the risk factor for TB? Depend on how the close contact, depend the infectiousness of the index, that means the amount of mycobacterium in the respiratory secretion, and depend on the immunity of the contact. Uh, the immunity of the contact, uh, if he has uh, any comorbidity like HIV infection, uh, drug abuse, silicosis, diabetes, severe kidney disease, and low body weight, organ transplant, uh, all the cancer, but especially the head and neck cancer, and any immuno, uh, immunosuppressant medication. We talk about the TB prevention as it is preventable disease, and this is, can be prevent uh, exposure during travel and prevent uh, and treat latent TB to, uh, to transverse to active disease by detection, early detection of uh, active disease or any TB cases, especially the high infectious pulmonary TB and laryngeal TB and by the detection of the, the contact of, uh, of, uh, of the active TB, latent TB, we should make the investigation to give the treatment. As there is a chance to transverse by 10 to 20% from latent TB to be active TB. So the prevention by uh, prevent exposure, by early detection of the active disease, and early detection of latent TB and to give treatment. The latest report from WHO uh, that 1.5 million people died from TB in 2020, which is very high number. And the multi-drug resistant remain public health crisis and health security threat. Only one in three people with drug resistant TB access treatment in 2020. And this is very serious problem that there is a spread of drug resistant TB. And globally, the incidence of falling is only 20% per year. And between 2015, 2020, accumulative reduction is 11%. If you remember the end strategy before uh, the goal is the reduction will be 20%. That is mean that uh, the goal received only uh, half away or 50% from the reduction. In 2020, 30 high TB burden countries accounted for 86% of new TB, but eight countries only account for two thirds of total, with India leading the account following by China, Indonesia, Philippines, Pakistan, Nigeria, Bangladesh, and South Africa. In spite of the spread of the infection and the new incidence of the infection, eight countries two thirds account for two thirds of all cases. I will talk about uh, chicken box. It is still a serious problem in spite of the vaccine. Uh, this is chicken box case in a child who is not vaccinated. And it is caused, it is viral infection caused by varicella zoster. And it is DNA virus. It is a member of herpes virus. After the primary infection of varicella, uh, the sensory, uh, the virus will stay in the sensory nerve ganglia as latent infection. Later on can be reactivation to cause herpes zoster. So it is viral infection. It can stay to cause a herpes zoster later on. Uh, this is a child, a varicella in child who is vaccinated. See the difference? Even the rush, it is uh, very less and the complication also will be less. The incubation period um, varied from 14 to 16 days after the exposure. Mild prodrome uh, of fever, malaise may occur one to two days before rash onset, particularly in adult. In the children, especially the vaccinated one, most likely the rash will be the first time. The varicella is highly contagious. It is very high infectious, 
and it can be spread from person to person, either by direct contact or inhalation of the aerosol from the vesicular fluid from the skin lesion or from the respiratory secretion. That is why we, uh, we should isolate the chicken box in airborne isolation. So the transmission will be either direct contact or aerosol uh, from the vesicular fluid, from the skin lesion or from the respiratory secretion. The complication of the varicella uh, in children, uh, it is infection or bacterial infection in the skin and soft tissue. In the adult, the most complication will be pneumonia, and it is really serious pneumonia. Uh, most of the cases, especially the unvaccinated, will go for intubation, and many of them uh, it can uh, cause this. The other complication or severe complication by virus includes cerebellar ataxia, encephalitis, viral pneumonia and hemorrhagic pneumonia, septicemia, toxic shock syndrome, necrotizing fasciitis, osteomyelitis, and septic arthritis. This is CT for uh, varicella pneumonia. Uh, the hospitalization from herpes zoster most likely increased with the age and uh, especially above 60, and the maximum will be above 80%. This is the, the, uh, through the year 2018 and 2019. Measles is uh, an acute viral respiratory disease. It is characterized by high-grade fever, and uh, there is prodromal symptom, uh, malaise, and the three C's. Three C's is cough, coryza, conjunctivitis. This is preceded the infection. Actually, it is macropabular rash. The rash preceded by the public sign or public spot, and this is very characteristic. It can precede the macropabular rash three or four days. So any suspected high fever, you should examine first the buckle of the, or the mouse of the patient. The rash uh, usually appears about 14 days after exposure. And uh, it is very characteristic, will start from the head, go down to the trunk and uh, lower extremities. The period of infectiousness uh, varied from four days before and four days after the rash appear. Sometimes the immunocompromised patient, there is no rash. That is why if there is any outbreak and there is immunocompromised patient, there is fever, we should investigate also. Uh, the vaccine, if there is any uh, traveler not vaccinated, he should get the vaccine two weeks before uh, the departure. If the trip less than two weeks, they should get MMR vaccine. Two doses from MMR vaccine provide 97% from protection. So the uh, measles vaccine should be at least two weeks before. If the trip is less than two weeks, we should give MMR vaccine. The reported worldwide measles recently increased by 79% in the first two months of 2020, compared to the same period in 2021. As of April 2022, uh, there is 20, uh, 21 large uh, measles outbreak and uh, reported most of these measles outbreak reported from Africa and uh, East Mediterranean region. Uh, it is uh, led by Somalia, Nigeria, Afghanistan, Ethiopia, and Bangladesh. Insufficient measles vaccine, this is the main cause, insufficient measles vaccine and also COVID-19 pandemic, which interrupted the immunization and overwhelm of uh, health system in most countries. The transmission of measles. Uh, the measles, as we said, it is the most uh, infectious through all the infectious diseases. The virus can be transmitted either by contact, direct contact, droplet and airborne. Uh, it is highly infectious that the virus remains two hours after the person leaves uh, the area. The diagnosis for the measles, we should suspect any case with febrile rash, especially if there is a recent trouble, 
or uh, any contact with a uh, person have febrile rush. Uh, the detection or the investigation or confirmation by IgM antibody in the serum or from the respiratory specimen, we will do BCR. So the confirmation by IgM or BCR. The complication can be otitis media, bronchopneumonia, laryngotracheobronchitis, uh, and uh, diarrheal disease. One out of every 1,000 measles case will develop encephalitis, and it can cause permanent brain damage. And one to three out of 1,000 uh, will die from respiratory and neurological complication. So the most serious complication in measles is a permanent brain damage from encephalitis and neurologic and respiratory complication. The people high risk from complication, infant and children, uh, aged less than five years, adult uh, more than 20, pregnant woman, and the immunocompromised patient. Um, both prophylaxis, if the, um, the exposure is within 72 hours, we should give measles vaccine. And if it is uh, MMR vaccine, I mean, sorry, or if it is within six days, we should give immunoglobulin, but never give together because it's invalidate the vaccine. We'll talk about mumps. Mumps uh, caused by paramyxovirus, and it is uh, one of the rubella uh, family. Uh, the average incubation 12 to uh, 16 to 18 days. The clinical feature of mumps by the swelling and tenderness and pain in the parotid gland, uh, the swelling peak usually one to three and subside next week. And usually it will subside after five days after the swelling start. The prodormal symptom uh, preceded the swelling by three to four days, myalgia, anorexia, malaise, and um, fever. The transmission, uh, because the virus replicate in the upper respiratory, so it will be contact and respiratory droplet, and the infectious period will be uh, two days before the swelling and up to five days after uh, the, on the onset of barotitis. The complication can be orchitis, orphitis, mastitis, meningitis, encephalitis, pancreatitis, and hearing less, uh, frequently in vaccinated uh, patient. Uh, so the complication will be in the unvaccinated. Uh, the orchitis occur 30% in unvaccinated and 6% in the vaccinated um, people. The orchitis not linked by infertility, but linked by testicular atrophy and high bone infertility. So it can cause testicular atrophy and high bone fertility. The vaccination uh, will be combined with MMR, measles, mumps, rubella, or MMRV, including uh, with them varicella. Two doses of mumps vaccine uh, are 88 prevent the infection, or if effective 88%. The diagnosis by BCR and culture, viral culture, and uh, the swab will be uh, for BCR from buccal swab or even from the urine and CSF in the case of complication of meningitis or IgM uh, serology, uh, but negative IgM will not rule the mumps. So it's a confirmation by BCR or by IgM. Legionella is serious disease, uh, can be get by the travel and it is linked for travelers. It is gram-negative bacteria. Most cases of Legionella caused by Legionella uh, pneumophilia, but other species also can cause uh, Legionella. Uh, the transmission will be by aerosolized uh, uh, water from the head shower, from the head shower or from cooling towers, decorative fountains, hot tubs, mist machine, and water park. Uh, the characteristic for the uh, Legionella, replication will be under the temperature uh, 25 to 42 uh, centigrade. This is less than this, more than this will kill the Legionella. And it, uh, it is also replicate if there is stagnation of water or if there is no disinfection of the water. Uh, this characteristic, we use it to uh, fight against Legionella. Uh, 
um, Junella, it is established in the industrialized uh, outbreak. Um, there is outbreak in United States increased by 350% from 2000 through 2016. There is also large outbreak in from cooling tower in Spain, 2001, and in Portugal also 2014. 2015, there is also from outbreak in Bronx from cooling tower. And 2016, 2017, also there is 50 cases or 51 confirmed cases uh, associated with the travel to Dubai. So everywhere you can get this Legionella. So the detection, or despite the, uh, the, uh, the environment that uh, in aquatic environment, the, there is uh, the following Legionella, but also the risk is low. We can decrease the risk of the Legionella by the Uh, the risk of Legionella, uh, it can be decreased by the decrease the exposure of aerosolized water. And also, we can stop that the people more than 50 and smoker uh, immunocompromised to go to the hot tub. The diagnosis, either by urinary antigen test or culture from the lower respiratory secretion or BCR. So the diagnosis, urine antigen test, this is the most common, or culture from the sputum or PCR from the respiratory secretion also. How we are preventing Legionella? Uh, as there is no vaccine for the Legionella, so the prophylaxis is also antibiotic or anything, it is not available. So we have to manage or uh, to have to work on the prevention uh, of the Legionella itself. So the water management program for building or water system, this is now in all over the world. And uh, prayer travel, we should, uh, in the travel clinic, uh, you should ask the traveler about the destination. So you can find if there is any outbreak. In CDC also, it is mentioned all the outbreak of the, of the uh, Legionella. And in European country, also there is website for surveillance for the latest for all the building. Any building there is Legionella, it is written here in the European country in this website. Uh, so from the characteristic of the Legionella temperature and stagnation, we can use this for prevention. So the flushing through shower with hot water before entering the shower, this is the most important. So inform all the travelers that they should flush the shower with hot water for three to four seconds because it will not leave above 50. So uh, they should um, make flush and also they should avoid the going to the hot tubs, especially in there is outbreak in that country. This is the recent uh, Legionella outbreak. And if you notice that it is all over the world with a confirmation of 10% of this. This is the latest uh, WHO report. Uh, thank you very much. I hope I finish on time. Uh, thanks a lot, Dr. Sumaya, for uh, this great informative presentation uh, about uh, travel-related airborne disease. Uh, you really uh, provide us with a great uh, idea about this uh, area. Uh, I think uh, I will open the floor for the audience. Uh, if you have any question for uh, Dr. Sumaya, uh, please feel free uh, to ask. Use the question and answer uh, box for answering uh, for uh, for asking question, please. We will have a, a brief of five to ten minutes for uh, receiving question. Please feel free.
Okay, the forum. We have a question here. Maybe we have we will wait a couple of minutes now to receive by the question. Uh, Dr. Gharib Salim asking, uh, is there any isolation for patient diagnosed with herpes zoster? Yes, immediately in the hospital, we are isolate the patient until the rash will be dry. We should, uh, it is airborne isolation. The other question is, uh, uh, what, is the uh, what is the least contact time while traveling to, con uh, to contact TB infection? Two. Uh, what is the least contact time while traveling to, con uh, to contract TB infection? Actually, it is starting from two hours up to eight hours. The, the longest the duration, the higher risk. And also uh, on the highly infectious patient. If there is highly infectious patient with the less duration, you can get the infection. But if it's less infection, the more uh, highest duration, the more risk, especially if the trouble is more than eight hours. Uh, here, Ras, sorry, you can proceed. Uh, regarding the duration also, uh, from two hours, the, they will be high. Uh, that is why I forgot to mention before in the aircraft, the pressurization system start in the high, in the wind altitude is 3,000 to 4,000. So in the ground, uh, the ventilation will not work. Before, I think uh, 1980s, there is outbreak because there is delay of the flight like three hours. Uh, so there is a very high lar or large outbreak. That is why they changed the rule now. It is, uh, even there is delay 30 minutes, immediately they will start the virtualization ventilation system. Thanks a lot for uh, Sumaya. Uh, there is uh, one question also from uh, Saoud uh, Abu Harbish. Uh, uh, who do you communicate with traveler? Who do you communicate with traveler? I'm uh, I'm a writer, so the Abu Harbish, or you can formulate your question, please. Uh, if it doesn't bother you, I didn't get the question. Uh, the question is, uh, who do you communicate with traveler? Uh, uh -huh. So the Abu Harbish, can you formulate your question again, please? The doctor get the, the question, or uh, you need to uh, him to formulate it again. Uh, if I get it right, uh, who will communicate with the travelers? Usually mm -hmm. the travelers um, coming to the, now there is clinic travel. Sometimes they are coming to the infection control asking about vaccine. So you will ask about the destination, you will give health education, and you will transfer to the travel clinic. So the one responsible is travel to clinic. But I think this is the responsibility for everyone. Thank you, thank you, Dr. Asumaya. Uh, I think no more question for now. Uh, I received one here. Uh, what, what I can do uh, if contact with a confirmed tuberculosis, tuberculosis case? Uh, if it's contact, uh, we will screen like BBD, quantiferon, chest X-ray, just to screen if it is latent or active. If it is latent TB, we should give a prophylactic anti-TB with either with refiner three to four uh, months or INS for uh, six to nine months. We will give prophylactic anti TB if there is latent after screening. Good, good. Okay, Victoria. Uh, we have also here uh, another question. Uh, do we have a 24 hour staff for travelers? No, this is Dr. Anna. I think she can answer for travel. Uh, you, you mean in travel clinic? I think came in travel clinic. Uh, Lenore Omar asking, do we have a 24-hour uh, step for travelers? I think came in, uh, in, clin uh, in clinics, 24-hour clinics. Mm -hmm. well, I, I, I don't know. <laughs> I think Dr. Amna can answer the timing for the travel clinic. Uh, Dr. Amna, do you have any idea if, if we have uh, any travel uh, clinic that work in 24 hours? Uh, sorry, we, uh, it's only with the BHCs working hours from 8 o'clock to 4 o'clock. There is no 24 hour for a travel clinic. And it is five days a week. 
Also, we are covering, as Dr. Sumaya said, uh, any patient can go to any hospital if he wants to have any vaccines or prophylactic treatment. And also uh, in the uh, preventive offices, also offering this uh, services. But now, because it is more uh, uh, organized with the travel clinic. Good, clear, clear, Dr. Ami. Thanks a lot. Thanks a lot. Uh, here we have another question. I think it will be the last question. Uh, Doctor, how we will distinguish uh, the latent TB from uh, TB disease? Latent TB, we can differentiate from by screening, as I said. If there is uh, any symptom by chest X ray, by AFB, if the patient is coughing by 24. On. If there is no symptom, is is negative, chest X ray is normal, and only the quantiferon or BBD is positive, that means it is latent TB. Uh, in that time, we will give a prophylactic and we will trace all the contact of the positive cases. Okay. Uh, thank you, Dr. Sumaya. for uh, answering. Uh, thanks a lot for uh, answering. Uh, now, by uh, this, we will end uh, the first lecture. I think uh, now we will proceed with our uh, second uh, speaker, uh, Dr. Babin uh, Mutaz, inshallah, uh, who will put uh, his uh, preventive medicine and public health physician, uh, who will explore with us, inshallah, malaria blood access. Uh, thank you, Dr. Sumaya, and welcome, Dr. Babin. Thank you very much. Bismillahirrahmanirrahim. Assalamu alaikum to everyone. Can you hear me, Dr. Arwa? Uh, yes, uh, your voice is clear and the uh, screen already shared. You can start, Dr. Arwa. Thank you, Dr. Arwa. Uh, Bismillahirrahmanirrahim. Uh, Assalamu alaikum to all the participants. It's, uh, it's really a matter of great delight and uh, honor for all of us. Uh, the and our department and Jubail General Hospital in particular, to see the very, very active, mashallah, participation uh, of so many people in our workshop. I think we are now, now already exceeding 3,000 plus people who are participating in this workshop online. Uh, I will start off with my lecture, which is on malaria and travel. Malaria, as we all know, is a highly uh, infectious uh, disease caused by the bite of uh, Anopheles female mosquito. Uh, malaria in humans is caused by the protozoan parasites of the genus Plasmodium. Uh, Plasmodium, uh, Falciparum, Vivax, Ovale, and Malaria. Among them, the most uh, dangerous one uh, is Plasmodium Falciparum which is more uh, prevalent uh, in uh, Africa, while Plasmodium vivax is uh, more uh, prevalent uh, towards uh, Asia, South Asia, Southeast Asia. However, uh, it does not mean that Felsiparum does not occur in other parts of the world. Um, it can happen anywhere. Uh, the important point to remember is that Plasmodium felsiparum is uh, the most uh, dangerous one and can lead to severe complications, even death, if not treated promptly. Transmission of malaria, uh, plasmodium species are mainly transmitted by the bite of an infected female uh, Anopheles uh, mosquito. Occasionally, transmission occurs by blood transfusion, organ transplantation, needle sharing, and even from mother to fetus. However, uh, these are very, very rare cases, hardly ever reported. 
uh, most of the cases reported in our preventive department are uh, all uh, those uh, who uh, who had a mosquito bite hardly any case uh, to the best of my knowledge ever reported after a blood transfusion or organ transplant or needle sharing uh, however this can also really very really take place if we talk about the epidemiology malaria is a major international public health problem uh, 91 countries reported an estimated 216 million infections and unfortunately 445,000 deaths in 2016 according to the World Health Organization World Malaria Report. Uh, this is uh, really a very, very uh, staggering figure, 445,000 deaths despite the fact that uh, very easily available malaria, malaria treatment is, uh, is available everywhere. Travelers going to malaria endemic countries are at risk of contracting the disease. Malaria transmission occurs in large areas of Africa, Latin America, parts of the Caribbean, in Asia, including South Asia, Southeast Asia, and the Middle East, Eastern Europe, and the South Pacific. So more, uh, more or less, it is uh, prevalent in most parts of the world, uh, as I have just mentioned in my slide. Here we have a map of the world in front of us. Uh, endemic areas, endemic countries are shown uh, in the brown or the red color. And we see that uh, most of Africa, apart from uh, a few countries on the north, uh, excluding Egypt, Libya, Tunisia, Algeria, and Morocco, most of Africa, along with the island of Madagascar, uh, the Arabian Peninsula, uh, Pakistan, India, China, most of Southeast Asia with uh, Myanmar, Thailand, Cambodia, Indonesia, and till the uh, Papua New Guinea. All these countries uh, are, are endemic. Non-endemic countries, as we can see, is the most part of Russia, Europe, as well as Australia. So travelers going to any of these countries, which are shown in red or the brown color, uh, must be given uh, prophylactic treatment if they visit our travel clinic. Uh, if we talk about... Uh, South America as a continent, and uh, we can see that uh, apart from Argentina and Chile in the south, most of the South American countries are also in the, with the malaria. And Central America, we can see that Mexico, Panama, and all these small countries like uh, Costa Rica, Honduras, they are also uh, endemic. Any traveler going to these areas should also be given profile. The risk of acquiring malaria differs substantially from traveler to traveler and from region to region, even within the same country. This variability is a function of the intensity of transmission within the various regions and the itinerary, uh, duration, season, and type of travel. Season matters a lot because, you know, especially during the rainy seasons, uh, if the traveler is going to visiting any, any part of the country when uh, the season is raining, there is lots of rain, water, uh, obviously there will be more uh, mosquitoes and more chance of uh, acquiring malaria. Risk also varies by traveler's adherence to mosquito precautions and prophylaxis recommendations. I can give an example here that in 2015, a total of 1,513 cases of malaria were diagnosed in the United States among travelers. Out of these 1513 cases, 85 acquired uh, the malaria while their visit in Africa, 9% uh, acquired it during a visit to Asia, 5% uh, visited Caribbeans and the other parts of Americas, uh, South America and uh, Central America and only 1% got it uh, after their visit from the Middle East. Malaria knocks you flat. This is for sure. Uh, if 445,000 people died of malaria in 2016, as per the WHO report, which I previously mentioned, then obviously it can knock anybody flat and it has to be taken very, very seriously by anyone, including the travelers. Obviously. What will be the clinical presentation? Malaria is characterized by fever and influenza-like symptoms, including chills, headache, myalgias, and malaise. These symptoms can occur intermittently. The traveler needs to be informed because fever can have so many causes, but especially in malaria, there will be a cold cycle and a hot cycle. If suddenly the patient develops fever and after a few hours, he 
there is no more fever and this cycle goes on and on fever no fever fever no fever there is a possibility that he may be or she may be a case of malaria needs to be diagnosed immediately in severe diseases seizures mental confusion even kidney failure acute respiratory distress syndrome coma and if still not treated even death can occur continuation of the clinical presentation malaria symptoms can develop as early as 7 days after being bitten by an infectious mosquito in a malaria endemic area and as late as several months or more after exposure suspected or confirmed malaria especially plasmodium falciparum is a medical emergency requiring urgent intervention as clinical deterioration can occur rapidly and unpredictably so basically what i'm saying here is that the incubation period for malaria is uh, is is we cannot say anything by certainty that within 5 to 7 days or within few hours or few months it will happen it can happen very soon and it can happen very late also uh, here can i ask a question uh, from my, from my listeners when i say incubation period what is incubation period can any of the listeners reply please what is incubation period do we have any replies uh, dr arwa any participation from uh, you uh, with audience yes the question uh, dr. is dr babar is asking uh, yes. about the patient period is there any what is incubation uh, period any of the respected uh, audience uh, those who are attending our lecture can anyone please reply? what is an incubation period there is one answer here it is a time from entering to the body uh, to show symptoms yes good yeah this is good uh, i'll just uh, another answer dr babel here is time okay. from infection to signs excellent excellent anyone else dr arwa any other reply uh the third reply is the period between exposure to infection excellent excellent very nice mashallah most of our participants they know very much uh, as to what incubation period is incubation period can be defined as the entry of the agent into the body appearance of the sign and symptoms okay so incubation period agent by uh, the entry of the agent means uh, it can be a bacteria it can be a parasite it can be a virus the time of the entry of the agent by agent it can be a bacteria it can be a virus it can be anything till the appearance of sign and symptoms so generally in this slide i am saying that it can start as early as 7 days and it can take many months also uh, for the for the sign and symptoms to appear thank you to all those who have answered the question okay let's go to the next slide which is about diagnosis travelers who have symptoms of malaria should seek medical evaluation as soon as possible consider malaria in any patient with a febrile illness who has recently returned from a malaria endemic country blood smear microscopy obviously remains the most important and uh, prevalent and the highly effective method of malaria diagnosis microscopy can provide immediate information about the presence of parasites allow quantification of the density of the infection and also allow determination of the species of the malaria parasite all of which are necessary for providing the most appropriate treatment microscopy results should ideally be available within a few hours now here if i can just add that uh, microscopy results why are they important because they will also give us a clear indication what type of malaria is it because uh, as i will go on into my lecture uh, if it is plas plasmodium falciparum malaria falciparum the treatment regimen is different if it is vivax the treatment regimen is different so that is why it is very important and very very uh, pivotal to know as to what type of malaria it is and that can be uh informed by the laboratory through a blood smear microscopy fortunately now we even have a rapid diagnostic test rdts for malaria to detect the agents derived from malaria parasites 
Malaria rapid diagnostic tests are immunochromatographic tests that most often use a dipstick format and provide results in two to 15 minutes only. Rapid diagnostic tests offer a useful or alternative to microscopy in situations where reliable microscopic diagnosis is not immediately available. So that is why RTDs are very, very uh, important uh, as far as travelers are concerned. Maybe he or she is in a place where uh, laboratory is not uh, close by. You know? So just by doing this test, uh, RTD test, uh, he or she can find out if uh, it is positive for malaria or not. The problem is that all, although RTDs can detect malaria antigens within minutes, they have several limitations also. RTDs cannot distinguish, uh, distinguish between all the plasmodium species that affect humans. They may be less sensitive than expert microscopy or PCR for diagnosis. They cannot also quantify parasitemia. And the RTD positive test result may persist for days or weeks after an infection has been treated and cleared. Thus, RTDs are not useful for assessing response to therapy. Having said that, still, I think they are, they are, they are very, very uh, beneficial, especially in case of travelers. Traveling to uh, maybe he's in the middle of nowhere, not anywhere close to a hospital or a laboratory, in that case, if he or she develops fever and he wants to or she wants to rule out malaria, RTDs can give you very, very quick results. Okay. Uh, yesterday, we had a lot of questions, I and Dr. Ramna, so we have added some uh, questions here already, uh, which uh, the travelers uh, can more, most likely ask if they visit a travel. One of the questions can be, how do I address concerns about side effects of prophylaxis? So prophylaxis can be started earlier, there are concerns about tolerating a particular medis medication. For example, mefloquine can be started two to three weeks in advance to allow potential adverse events to occur before travel. If unacceptable side effects develop, there would be time to change the medication before the traveler's departure. The drugs used for anti-malarial prophylaxis are generally well tolerated though. Another question can be, what should be done uh, if the dose of prophylaxis is, is uh, missed? For a weekly drug, for a weekly drug, prophylactic blood levels uh, can remain adequate if they are only one to two days late. If this is the case, the traveler can take a dose as soon as possible, then resume weekly doses on the originally scheduled day. If the traveler is more than two days late, blood levels may not be adequate. In this case, the traveler should take a dose as soon as possible. For an early drug, if the traveler is one to two days late, protective blood levels are less likely to be maintained. They should take a dose as soon as possible and resume the daily schedule at the new time of the day. What happens if too high a dose of prophylaxis is taken? Overdose of anti-malarials, particularly uh, chloroquine, can be fatal. Medications should be stored in child-proof containers out of the reach of infants and children. Another question uh, generally posed by the travelers while visiting the travel clinic, isn't malaria a treatable disease? Why not carry a treatment dose of anti-malarials instead of taking malaria prophylaxis? Now, this is a commonly asked question that we face among, the, among, among travelers. The answer to this question is that malaria could be very fatal even when treated, which is why it is always preferable to prevent malaria cases rather than rely on treating infections after they occur. So you cannot deny the uh, advantages that uh, malaria prophylaxis treatment have. It is always, always advisable to prescribe the prophylaxis to the traveler, give him the education, and ensure that he takes it on time to avoid malaria from happening at all. What should be done if fever develops while traveling in a malaria endemic area? Again, a commonly asked question from the travelers. Malaria could be fatal if treatment is delayed. Medical help should be sought promptly if malaria is suspected. Travelers should continue to take malaria prophylaxis while in the malaria endemic area. 
what should be done if a traveler took malaria prophylaxis develop fevers after returning from their trip now this is also uh, this has happened i mean the, the traveler will come back for a post travel uh, meeting he would say i have taken all my prophylaxis on time and still i have fever this is very much possible so malaria prophylaxis though highly effective is not always 100% patent travelers should be advised that they should seek medical care immediately if fever develops report their travel history get tested for malaria and get treated promptly if infection is confirmed now let's uh, move on towards the treatment of malaria you have a case of malaria in front of you uh, which is a very very uh, frequent thing happening to us in our preventive department cases do come to us with malaria falciparum and vivax what is the treatment malaria can be treated effectively early in the course of the disease but delay but delay of therapy can have serious or fatal consequences so like any other disease it's uh, it's good to start treatment as soon as possible specific treatment options depend on the species of malaria the severity of the infection the likelihood of drug resistance based on where the infection was acquired and the patient's age and pregnancy status here i have a table uh, for all of you to see please this is very very important table uh, approved by the who as well as by the ministry of health here uh, within the kingdom of saudi arabia for example if you have a case of malaria falciparum uh, i will talk about adults more than 13 years of age more than 50 kg uh, kg kg weight and about uh, 13 years of age we use two tablets artisunate as well as fencidar when i say fencidar fencidar includes uh, sulfadoxine and pyrimethamine so on day 1 three tablets of fencidar uh, sulfadoxine and pyrimethamine will be taken stat and along with this uh, four uh, tablets uh, 50 mg each uh, total dose 200 mg of artisunate will also be taken this is day 1 and day 2 and day 3 the patient will only take uh artisanate in case uh, we don't have artisanate and sulfadoxine and paramethamine uh the second treatment includes artemether and lumifentrine this is also available uh, very easily in all ministry hospitals and uh, this is to be given again for adults uh, 14 13 14 years uh, in age and 34 kg in excess of weight eight tablets are taken on day 1 morning and evening eight tablets day 2 eight tablets day 3 here i must add that a single dose of primaquine 15 mg tablet is also to be given uh, in case of first line as well as second line treatment so this table uh, i think all hospitals should have it uh, i am sure they already have it they are they are they are using it and it also includes the treatment of severe malaria it also includes the treatment uh, of malaria uh, among pregnant women Uh, did not to mention it's very clear there uh, in case of severe malaria iv quinine is used and in case of pregnancy uh, first trimester for example it mentions quinine plus clindamycin and in case of purpurium uh, artisunate and uh, sulfadoxine is used along with paramethamine prevention once we go to the prevention part malaria prevention consists of a combination of uh, of uh, of mosquitoes uh, malaria prevention consists of a combination of mosquito avoidance measures and chemo prophylaxis preventive measures must address all malaria species in the area of travel and apply to both short term and long term travelers Although highly efficacious, the recommended interventions are not 100% effective, as mentioned before. Also, preventing malaria involves striking a balance between effectiveness and safety, ensuring that all people at risk for infection use the recommended preventive measures. For the continuation of prevention, several factors increase a traveler's risk of uh, malaria. travel even for a short period of time to areas with intense malaria transmission can result into infection malaria transmission uh, as we all would agree agree is not distributed homogeneously throughout a country so it will be important to review the exact itinerary to determine if travel will occur in highly endemic areas 
Here, if we talk of Saudi Arabia, uh, malaria is endemic only in certain regions of malaria. You won't find malaria in every part of Saudi Arabia. You find only cases, I'm talking about indigenous cases, only in regions like Jeddah and Jizal. These are the two areas uh, for the information of the audience who are listening, that the endemic areas within Saudi Arabia are Jeddah and Jizal. Most of the cases that we receive in Jubail, uh, I'm in Jubail Preventive Office, are either they are uh, people who came back recently from Asia or from Africa. And the cases from Asia, 99.9% .9 of them are Plasmodium vivax. And the cases coming from Africa, 99.9% .9 of them are Malaria falciparum. This is also very important. In countries where malaria is seasonal, travel during peak transmission season also increases the risk. Travelers going to rural areas or staying in accommodations without screens or air conditioning will also be at higher risk. Obviously, if the windows, doors are open, more access for the mosquitoes to get into the room. Several factors. Uh, okay, this is just a table here which uh, gives us the A, B, C, D of malaria prevention. Uh, a is for awareness. Awareness of any disease would help the traveler to protect Herself against it. Bite prevention, avoid being bitten by mosquitoes, especially between dusk and dawn. This is the time where, where most of the mosquitoes go out for, uh, for you know, that is the more uh, uh, appropriate time for mosquitoes to be outside or to be uh, inside the room and to bite. Chemoprophylaxis, take anti malarial drugs, chemoprophylaxis when appropriate to prevent infection. And obviously, diagnosis I have mentioned before also. So this is the ABCD of the malaria prevention. This information must be passed on to each and every traveler visiting your travel clinic. Mosquito avoidance measures are very important, apart from the prophylaxis that is given to the patient. Because of the nocturnal feeding habits of Anopheles mosquitoes, malaria transmission occurs primarily between dusk and dawn. Contact with mosquitoes can be reduced by remaining in well-screened areas, sleeping under mosquito nets, preferably insecticide-treated nets. Using an effective insecticide spray in living and sleeping areas during evening and night hours and wearing clothes that cover most part of the bodies. Obviously, the mosquito will bite uh, where the skin is exposed, the hands, the arms, so keeping your body uh, covered with clothing will uh, uh, will not be possible for the mosquito to bite you. The travel. All travelers should use an effective uh, mosquito repellent. Repellents should be applied to exposed parts of the skin when mosquitoes are likely to bite. If travelers are also wearing sunscreen, sunscreen should be applied first and the insect, insect repellent second. Why? Because if it is applied after the sunscreen, uh, the odor that it gives, which keeps the mosquito away, uh, will not be there. And, uh, and because of that, because of that smell coming out of that repellent, still there is a possibility that the mosquito can bite. This is also an important information that must be passed on to the traveler, especially in going to areas where the, where the weather is hot. In addition to using a tropical insect repellent, a permethrin-containing product may be applied to bed nets and clothing for additional protection against mosquitoes. Chemoprophylaxis, all recommended primary prophylaxis regimes involve taking a medicine before, during, and after travel to an area with malaria. Beginning the drug before travel allows the anti-malarial agent to be in the blood before the traveler is exposed to the malaria parasite. In choosing a prophylaxis regime before travel, the traveler and the travel health provider should consider several factors. These include the presence of anti-malarial drug resistance in the area of travel, the patient's other medical conditions, any allergic history and potential side effects. Now, this point is very, very important. Asking the traveler, where do you intend to go? Because certain parts of the, of the world have resistance to chloroquine and certain other drugs that we use for uh, chemoprophylaxis. Medications used for prophylaxis, uh, chloroquine, uh, very widely used all the world over, including in the Kingdom of Saudi Arabia. Chloroquine phosphate or hydroxychloroquine sulfate 
can be used for prevention of malaria only in destinations where chloroquine resistance is not present. Prophylaxis should begin one to two weeks before travel to the malaria area. Reported side effects include gastrointestinal disturbance. Uh, if the patient is using chloroquine, it can also cause headache, dizziness, uh, blurring of the vision, some some report of insomnia and pruritus, but generally these effects do not require that a drug should be discontinued. High doses of chloroquine, however, such as those used to treat rheumatoid arthritis have been associated with retinopathy. This serious side effect appears to be extremely unlikely when chloroquine is used for routine uh, weekly malaria prophylaxis. Chloroquine and related compounds have been reported to exacerbate psoriasis though, People who experience uncomfortable side effects after taking chloroquine may tolerate the drug better by taking it after meals. As an alternative, the related compound hydroxychloroquine sulfate may be a better uh, may be better tolerated. The other drug that we uh, readily use uh, in our clinics is mefloquine. Mefloquine prophylaxis should begin more than two weeks before travel to malarious areas. It should be continued uh, once a week, same like chloroquine, on the same day of the week during travel in malarious areas and for four weeks after the traveler leaves uh, the infected areas. Mefloquine has been associated with rare but serious adverse reactions such as psychosis or seers at prophylactic doses. These reactions are more frequent uh, with the higher dose used for treatment. Other side effects that have occurred in prophylaxis studies include gastrointestinal disturbance, headache, insomnia, abnormal dreams, visual disturbances, depression, anxiety disorders, and dizziness. However, as I've mentioned, all these side effects are rare. Generally, mefloquine is a very effective uh, chemoprophylactic uh, drug for malaria and for travelers. Other more severe neuropsychiatric disorders have been occasionally reported and include sensory and motor neuropathies such as paresthesia, tremor and ataxia, agitation or restlessness, mood changes, panic attacks, forgetfulness, confusion, hallucinations, aggression, paranoia and encephalopathy. Rarely psychiatric symptoms have been reported to continue long after mefloquine has been stopped. But I must mention here again uh, to all the audience who are listening, these are all very, very rare uh, side effects. Doxycycline. Doxycycline prophylaxis should begin one to two days before travel to malaria area. It should be continued once a day at the same time each day, preferably during travel in malarious areas and daily for four weeks after the traveler reaches such areas. Gastrointestinal side effects, obviously after antibiotics, including nausea and vomiting, may be minimized by taking the drug with a meal. Doxycycline is also in people. Uh, Dr. Babi, your voice is not clear. My voice is not clear? Uh, now it's better. Now it is better, Doctor? Yes, it's not specific. Okay, okay. I will, I will continue. I was talking about doxycycline. Uh, I was mentioning that it is also used after chloroquine and mefloquine. Doxycycline is also used uh, as, a, as a chemoprophylaxis. Doxycycline, however, is contraindicated in people with an allergy to tetracyclines. It is contraindicated for pregnant women and in infants and children aged less than eight years. Vaccination with the oral typhoid vaccine, TY21, should be delayed for more than 24 hours after taking a dose of doxycycline. Proganil is another drug uh, that is used uh, is a fixed combination of drugs, uh, atrovacune and proganil. Prophylaxis should begin one to two days before travel to malarious areas and should be taken daily. Proguenil is well tolerated and side effects are rare. The most common adverse effects reported in people using etoquine, proguenil for prophylaxis for treatment are abdominal pain, nausea, vomiting, and headache. 
This drug is uh, not recommended for prophylaxis in children weighing less than 5 kg, 11 pounds. It's not recommended for pregnant women or patients with severe renal impairment, creatinine clearance less than 30. Uh, this gives us a lot of, uh, we started with chloroquine, we went on to uh, uh, proconil, doxycycline, mefloquine, all these drugs. Uh, these are all options that we as doctors uh, and travel clinic or any other clinic, wherever a traveler visits you, you have in front of you. However, history taking is important. Uh, for example, like proganil, not to be given to pregnant women, doxycycline, not to be given to pregnant travelers. So these are all important questions that you need to ask once a traveler visits you in your clinic. Travel to areas with limited malaria transmission. Now, a traveler may be visiting an area where there is limited transmission. So what to do? For destinations where malaria cases are, occur sporadically and risk for infection to travel, travelers is assessed as being low, CDC recommends that travelers use mosquito avoidance measures only and no prophylaxis should be, should be prescribed. So for such cases, for such travelers who are going to areas where malaria is not uh, endemic or there is less possibility of having malaria, only the uh, mosquito avoidance measures would be enough. Travel to areas with chloroquine resistant malaria. So in this uh, situation, what, what options do we have? Chloroquine resistant plasmodium falciparium is found in all parts of the world except the Caribbean and countries west of the Panama Canal. Chloroquine resistant plasmodium falciparum predominates in Africa. Also found in combination with chloroquine sensitive plasmodium vivax malaria in South America and Asia. Resistance to plasmodium vivax to chloroquine has been confirmed only in Papua New Guinea and Indonesia. We have a lot of travelers going to Indonesia, so this is a, uh, important information for them. For destinations where any chloroquine resistant malaria is present, in addition to mosquito avoidance measures, prophylaxis options are proganil doxycycline and mefloquine. So these other drugs are highly effective and they can be used in case if the traveler is going to an area where uh, chloroquine resistance problem uh, is, is present. Travel to areas with mefloquine resistant uh, malaria. Mefloquine resistant plasmodium falciparum has been confirmed in Southeast uh, Asia on the borders of Thailand, Burma, Myanmar, Cambodia, and the southern Vietnam. For destinations where mefloquine resistant malaria is present, in addition to mosquito avoidance measures, prophylactic, prophylactic options are proganil and doxycycline. Prophylaxis for infants, children, and adolescents. All children traveling to malaria endemic areas should use recommended preventive measures, which often include taking an anti malarial drug. Pediatric doses should be calculated very carefully. Uh, weight, but should never exceed the adult dose. The table that I mentioned that I showed to the August audience before in my lecture, it also covers the weight and age for the children, and it should be very, very carefully calculated to avoid overdosage or underdosage. If the child is unable to swallow the capsular or the capsules or the tablets, parents should prepare the child's dose of medication by breaking open the gelatin capsule or crushing the pill and mixing the drug with a small amount of something sweet. What I mean to say here is that there is no excuse. Even the children must be given the dose to give them protection against malaria. Chloroquine and mefloquine are options for infants and children of all ages and weights, depending on drug resistance at that destination. Primaquine can be used for children who are not G6 ED deficient traveling to areas with principally Primavax. Primaquine, uh, as we all know, and I would like to just uh, highlight and mention, anyone with G6 ED deficiency should obviously not be given Primaquine. Doxycycline uh, may be used for children aged more than eight years, and Proganil may be used as prophylaxis for infants and children weighing more than five kg. Okay, prophylaxis during pregnancy and breastfeeding. If you have a traveler, uh, a lady who is uh, pregnant or uh, breastfeeding a child, so malaria infection in pregnant women can be more severe than in non-pregnant women. Malaria increases the risk of uh, of 
Malaria increases the risk for adverse uh, pregnancy outcomes, including prematurity, spontaneous abortion, and stillbirth. This must be informed to the, to the pregnant lady. For these reasons, and because no prophylaxis regime is completely effective, women who are pregnant or likely to become pregnant should be advised to avoid travel to areas with malaria transmission uh, if possible. If travel to a malaria area cannot be deferred or cannot be canceled, use of an effective prophylaxis regime is essential along with mosquito avoidance measures. Pregnant women traveling to areas where chloroquine resistant P. falciparum, plasmodium falciparum has been uh, has not been reported may take chloroquine prophylaxis. Chloroquine has not been found to have harmful effects on the fetus when used in the doses for malaria prophylaxis. Therefore, pregnancy is not a contraindication for malaria prophylaxis with chloroquine or hydroxychloroquine. For travel to areas where chloroquine resistance is present, mefloquine is the only medication recommended for malaria prophylaxis during pregnancy. Studies of mefloquine use during pregnancy have found no indication of adverse effects on the fetus. Thank you all for your patience. Uh, the last thing before I finish my lecture that I would like to mention, uh, which, is, which is an important information regarding malaria as well, that uh, WHO has approved a vaccine, uh, a vaccine for, uh, for, uh, for malaria. The only approved vaccine as of 2021 is the RTSS, known by the brand name of Moxcurix. In October 2021, the WHO for the first time recommended the large-scale use of malaria vaccine for children living in areas with moderate to high malaria transmission. This vaccine, uh, RTSS vaccine approved by WHO, is a vaccine that acts against Plasmodium falciparum, which is the deadliest malaria parasite globally and most prevalent in Africa. So this is a good news as far as uh, malaria control, malaria prevention is concerned, that now we have a, even have a vaccine for uh, malaria that has been approved by none other but by the WHO, World Health Organization, and it is under use, and it is, it is uh, having very, very good effects and for preventing uh, the deadliest form of malaria, malaria falciparum in Africa. I thank you all once again. Uh, thank you very, very much to all of you. Uh, Dr. Babur, mashallah, tabarakallah, great and uh, actually very informative uh, lecture. Uh, you explored a bit the uh, malaria chemoprophylaxis, which is an area which uh, always, always questionable. But mashallah, tabarakallah, you asked most of this uh, question. Uh, if you allow me now, I will give the chance for uh, attendees uh, to uh, post their question. Yes, yes, uh, please. Yes, doctor. Pardon. Please use the question and the uh, answer uh, box to post your question. Uh, here we have a couple of questions. Maybe I yes, please. Yes, uh, please. What, uh, what, uh, what is required to travel to Bangladesh to prevent disease spreading there? As I mentioned, uh, Bangladesh is also one of those countries where uh, malaria is prevalent. So if a traveler is going to Bangladesh, uh, we will prescribe him uh, after taking a detailed history. If he uh, he will be prescribed chloroquine prophylaxis, uh, two tablets uh, per week to be taken on the same day, two weeks before travel, during travel, and then four weeks after he has uh, completed his travel. So basically, two tablets. One tablet is for 150 milligram. Uh, two tablets per day. For example, if he starts taking his tablets on every Monday, okay. So Monday, he takes two tablets, then the next Monday, again, two tablets, then the next Monday, again, two tablets. So every week, two tablets, starting two weeks before travel, then during his travel, and four weeks after completing his travel. This will give him enough protection, enough prophylactic uh, dose uh, to prevent uh, him ha having malaria. This is number one. Number two, uh, as I mentioned, uh, repellents can be used, uh, bed nets can be used. Uh, to be on the safer side also. Great. Thank you. Thank you, Dr. Babu. Uh, 
the second question here, what is uh, the appropriate, uh, what is the appropriate uh, preventive treatment for malaria carrier uh, if they travel to place where Morelia is uh, prevalent there? Can you repeat the question again? What is the appropriate? What is the appropriate, is the appropriate preventive treatment for malaria carrier if they travel to a place where uh, malaria is prevalent? I think if it is uh, endemic there. Same, the same, uh, Dr. Roa. Uh, the, uh, the dose is the same. We will not change uh, the dose. We will not increase the dose or decrease the dose. The, de the dose is the same as mentioned in the table that I shared uh, during my lecture. The question, what is the best preventive uh, medicine for uh, malaria for uh, my chronic patients, especially diabetic in case of travel? Is there any difference between them and uh, the normal or healthy individual? Yes, thank you. This is a very good question. Most of the travelers uh, visiting us, we will ask them this question. Uh, some of them are diabetic, hypertensive, asthmatic, chloroquine, mefloquine, doxycycline, all the drugs that I've mentioned during my, uh, during my lecture, there is no problem. These drugs can be used by a patient having any, any, any chronic disease and can be easily tolerated. Uh, the next question uh, is, uh, is the rapid test for uh, antigen is it specific and sensitive or uh, maybe false positive or false negative? Yes, it can be false positive and false negative. Uh, obviously, like any rapid test, we have rapid tests for HIV, for hepatitis C. I mean, obviously, they are not as uh, accurate uh, as, uh, as the, as the uh, test from the laboratory would be. But needless to say, they are very, very helpful. As I mentioned in my lecture also, the traveler may be in the middle of nowhere. So if he has a rapid test kit with him, he can do the test. But yes, there is possibility of false positive, false negative, and several other limitations. But still, uh, they, are, they are effective and they are a good tool. And uh, the good news is that they are even available now with the Ministry of Health. Yes, please. Any more questions? Question here is a question asking about the contraindication of chloroquine. Contraindication of uh, chloroquine. Uh, the first thing would be that I would ask a traveler is that uh, where are you going? If he's going to a chloroquine resistant area, uh, I would not prescribe it. Other than that, it's a very safe medicine. Uh, I mean, there are no specific complications. It can be it can be given to women. It can given can be given to children uh, by adjusting the dose. Uh, so there are no specific uh, contraindications. It can, can be given to, to all. Great. Uh, thank you. Uh, the next one, uh, Kingsley. Uh, Kingsley, uh, first of all, uh, thank you, doctor, for uh, this nice, very nice presentation. Uh, from the presentation, it was said that uh, the different species of uh, malaria do respond uh, to different anti-malaria. Does it mean that the malaria chemoprophylaxis is mentioned uh, can be used against all malaria species? Yes, it can be used against all malaria species. However, as I mentioned in the lecture, if later on still the patient or the traveler develops malaria, the treatment regime is different. The, the treatment for malaria falciparum is different, as I mentioned in my lecture also. It includes artisunate and uh, fencidar, which is uh, sulfadoxine and paramethamine. <laughs> However, if, if it is malaria Vivex, in that case, the treatment regime is different. It includes chloroquine and primaquine only. Mm -hmm. So uh, this is a difference. Uh, for the prophylaxis, the regime is the same. But if it is a confirmed case of malaria, for example, falciparum, treatment is different. For example, Vivex, treatment is different. Mm -hmm. Great, great, Dr. Uh, Babur. Uh, Dr. Babur, here uh, a question uh, repeated multiple times. Uh, what is the relation between this anti-malaria medication and uh, renal failure? Uh, this question repeated multiple times, and one of them mentioned that uh, one of uh, his relative took uh, quinine uh, IV uh, two times, uh, one month apart, and after that he developed renal failure. Is there any relation between anti-malaria and renal failure? No, no, there is uh, no relation. Uh, I think he must be having some other uh, issues because of which uh, the patient developed renal failure. It is very, very, very rare that uh, a patient may develop uh, hardly. I mean, I think the answer to this question should be no. There is no relation. Uh, as I mentioned, most of these drugs used for prophylaxis as well as uh, 
for treatment of malaria, uh, they have uh, they have no such uh, serious uh, consequences like uh, like renal failure. I think a detailed history of this patient needs to be taken. Uh, he or she might have some other issues because of renal failure took place, not because of the malarial medicines that he or she took. Thank you, Dr. Babur. Uh, here also I have uh, another question for you. Uh, is it recommended to take uh, prophylactic measure or treatment for immunocompromised patients if uh, traveled to a high-risk malaria outbreak area? Yes, surely, surely, because already he or she is immunocompromised. Uh, he needs all the protection, even, even more than a person who is healthy. Uh, another question, can individual or traveler after taking the vaccine against Plasmodium falciparum still take malaria chemoprophylaxis as it does not address other malaria species? Yes, yes, surely. Even if the vaccine is taken, uh, as I mentioned, there is a vaccine now available. Still, it is always good to avoid having malaria. Because yes, there's treatment for malaria, but it can be fatal. So always take maximum protection, still use the chemoprophylaxis. Uh, here's the last question, I think. Uh, if any missing, uh, uh, if any missing any dose, what is the proper action? Yes, uh, uh, I mentioned this part in my in my lecture also. Uh, no problem. I'll just repeat it again. Most welcome. If a dose is missed, start take the next dose as soon as possible. As I mentioned, chemoprophylaxis medicine is taken on weekly basis. It's not taken on daily basis. So if the traveler was supposed to take it on Monday and he forgot to take it on Monday, he can start again from Tuesday. As soon as possible, whenever he remembers, he should, he should take the dose. Thank you. Thank you a lot, Dr. Babur, for Thank you to you, Dr. Arroya, and thank you to all the worthy and honorable participants. Thank you very much for your active participation. Thank you. Thank you. Okay, my uh, good audience. Uh, uh, by this, I will end uh, the question for uh, this lecture. Uh, now, just uh, allow me to present our uh, allow me to present our uh, next speaker, Inshallah, Dr. Anima Dosari, consultant uh, gynecologist, uh, who present uh, to us uh, the travel hazard during uh, pregnancy. Uh, welcome, uh, Dr. Anima Dosari. Please take the lead. Assalamu alaikum. Ayo, Dr. Roa, wab hal slide? Ayo, slide wab, full files are replayed. Okay, Bismillah Rahman Rahim, Salah Salam, Alam Muhammad, Alah, Alah, was happy here, Jumain. Bilbida, I have Ashkar, Mustashfa, Jubel, and Amu, Alah, Rasum, Sadiq, Dr. Amna Rashidi, Alah, giving me this opportunity to participate in this very nice presentation about travel hazards. وأحب أشكر برضو الشركة والفريق المنظم على حسن الترتيب ما شاء الله. Also I would like to thank my previous colleagues speakers for their very excellent and nice presentation, which myself I gain lots of information for things either we already know and forgot, and also for new things really about the travel clinic. Uh, yesterday and also today, Dr. Babar and Dr. Asumaya for their great uh, lectures. Uh, really, they made uh, my life easy because of uh, they mentioned all the details about all the infectious disease and all the preventive measure we should take. Uh, my talk will be, uh, inshallah, very light about uh, travel hazards during pregnancy. Uh, when I first uh, tried to prepare for this presentation, one question jumped into my mind uh, that all of us as a health practitioner, whether doctor, nurse, any health practitioner can face during uh, any uh, of his travel. Uh, when something happened inside an airplane or a car or train or anywhere, uh, and uh, somebody is calling, uh, is there a doctor on board? When somebody is sick, because uh, in spite of all the preventive measure that can be taken uh, and the great advice in a travel clinic, still complication can happen, whether for a pregnant lady or uh, any other patient. So 
I will mention here two happy stories just to mention uh, how complication or accident can happen and during our travel. Um, usually around 353,000 children are born every day in the entire world, but no one really cares about them. However, a baby born on June 16, 2016, got media highlights as she was on Saudi airline flight SV-21 uh, traveling to New York. Uh, there was uh, a pregnant lady who entered into labor. That time, pilot declared an emergency situation. A Saudi Arabian airline public officer confirmed at mid-flight birth, saying that a happy event forced the Jeddah, New York, plane to land in London. Um, the airplane landed uh, in Heathrow Airport, and uh, uh, there was uh, a happy situation when a healthy uh, baby was delivered. Uh, yani that baby was really lucky because uh, she had a free ticket all her life to travel in Saudi airline. Also, another story about uh, another lady, her name is Sue Ler Tsu, was a fly flying from Singapore uh, to uh, Myanmar on the budget airline when she went into labor also and delivered a baby boy with the help of the crew and three doctors who were also on board. To show her gratitude, the mother paid a tribute to the crew in the baby's name, uh, so Jetstar, which is the airline company. Uh, it was uh, also in April, same year, 2016. From this two story, just I wanna give a message that whatever we are doing before traveling, uh, and uh, a patient can be ready, still complication can happen. So all of us as health practitioner, we should be ready to help people at all the time. And maybe we will be the hero at that day. Now I will start with my outlines in the lecture. Uh, introduction, pre-travel preparation, contraindication to travel during pregnancy, transportation consideration, environmental consideration and activities, infectious disease and vaccination, a last home message. First, as we all know, women experience physiological changes in a pregnancy that require special consideration when traveling. But with careful preparation, however, most pregnant women are able to travel safely. So we must do some pre-travel preparation, especially in a travel clinic, as Dr. Amna mentioned. First, check for immunity or infectious disease, for example, hepatitis A, B, rubella, varicella, measles, pertussis, uh, update immunization as needed. Then check policies and necessary paperwork, like supplemental travel insurance, travel health insurance, and medical evacuation insurance. Uh, check airline and cruise line policies for pregnant women, uh, letter confirming due date and fitness to travel, and prepare copy of her medical records. Preparing for obstetric care at destination site. Uh, so you have to check for medical insurance coverage. Also arrange for obstetric care at destination as needed. Last, review sign and symptoms required immediate care. So every a pregnant woman, she must know when she has to call for help, like if she will have pelvic or abdominal sudden abdominal pain, bleeding, rupture of membrane, contraction, or a preterm labor, symptoms of preeclampsia, like uh, swelling, uh, uh, sudden severe headache, blurred vision, uh, nausea, vomiting, uh, vomiting, uh, diarrhea, and dehydration. This is an example of the paperwork uh, that uh, will include all the uh, medical information, past medical information, or uh, if the patient is a pregnant, she must uh, uh, write all the details by her uh, ob uh, obstetric uh, doctor that include all her information, uh, any important details uh, that must be um, uh, put before travel. 
These are some contraindications to travel during pregnancy. Uh, there are some absolute contraindication like a prophylactic placenta, active labor, incompetent cervix, premature labor, or premature rupture of membrane, suspected ectopic pregnancy, threatened abortion, toxemia. Uh, relative contraindication include abnormal presentation, uh, IGR or fetal growth restriction, history of fertility, history of miscarriage, multiple gestation, a placenta previa, or other placental abnormalities. After that, I would like to speak about some consideration in the transportation of pregnant women. Pregnant women should be advised to wear seat belts whenever available on all forms of transport, including airplanes, cars, and buses. A diagonal shoulder strap with a lab belt to provide the best protection. The shoulder belt should be worn between the breast and the lab belt low across the upper thighs. When only a lab belt is available, it should be worn low between the abdomen and the pelvis. During air travel, uh, there is some information. Must commercial uh, airline allow pregnant traveler to fly until late 36 weeks of gestation, but some limit international travel earlier in a pregnancy, and some require documentation of gestational age. A pregnant traveler should check the airline for specific requirement or guidance. Women with pre-existing cardiovascular problem, sickle cell disease, or severe anemia when hemoglobin drop less than 80 gram per deciliter may experience the effect of low arterial oxygen saturation. Also, there is harm of potential exposure to communicable disease, as my previous uh, colleagues mentioned, uh, hazard of immobility and uh, limitation of uh, mobility in airplane, common discomfort, abdominal distension, and foot edema. In this picture, I recommend here all pregnant traveler to spoil herself and benefit from upgrade in airline seating and should seek convenient and practical accommodation such as a close proximity to the toilet. I put this picture just to show how happy this pregnant woman sitting in uh, first uh, class in airline and this is a picture of my own brother, Hamad, who's happened to work in uh, airport, King Fahad Airport. Now, I will speak about some measure to prevent DVT that can happen, of course, because of limitation of mobility inside the airplane and also because of her pregnant situation. Some measure may include frequent stretching, walking from now and then, isometric leg exercises, and wearing graduated compression stockings. There is a point that can be worrisome to some pregnant woman, which is uh, the X-ray scanner uh, inside airport. There is some information I'd like to mention, just to reassure them. Cosmic radiation during air travel poses little threat, little threat, but may be a consideration for pregnant travelers who are frequent flyers, such as air crew. Older airport, like our airport security machines, are magnetometers and are not harmful to the fetus. Newer security machine use backscatter X-ray uh, scanners, which emit low levels of radiation. And most experts agree that the risk of complications from radiation exposure from these scanners is extremely low. I put here one study just for reassurance of the pregnant woman that uh, been done by John Hopkins University in 2010 that show that the amount of radiation from this uh, backscatter X-ray is really, really absolutely low and there is no harm at all to the fetus. After air travel, I would like to speak about cruise ship travel. Uh, which more or less has the same information or preparation like the airplane. Most cruise lines restrict travel beyond the 28 weeks of gestation and some as early as 24 weeks. 
pregnant travelers may be required to carry a physician note stating that they are fit to travel, including the estimated date of delivery. Also, pregnant women should check the cruise line for specific requirement or guidance or papers. The pregnant traveler planning a cruise should be advised regarding motion sickness, gastrointestinal and respiratory infection, and the risk of falls on a moving vessel. There are some uh, environmental considerations like air pollution. Uh, of course, uh, especially in respiratory disease like uh, asthma, she must take care of that. Uh, temperature extremes, accommodation should be sought in air conditioned room, activities at ha high altitude should be avoided. Pregnant travelers should be discouraged from undertaking unaccustomed vigorous activity. Swimming and snorkeling during pregnancy is absolutely safe. Uh, most experts advise against scuba diving for pregnant women because of risk of fetal gas embolism during decompression. Riding bicycle or motorcycle or animal present risk of a trauma to the abdomen. Now I would like to speak about infectious disease that may encounter. Respiratory and urinary infections and vaginitis are more likely to occur and to be more severe in pregnancy. Pregnant women who develop traveler diarrhea or other gastrointestinal infection may be more vulnerable to dehydration than an unpregnant traveler. Strict hand hygiene and food and water precautions should be stressed the treatment of choice for a traveler diarrhea is a prompt and vigorous oral hydration. However, azithromycin antibiotic may be given to pregnant women if it's clinically indicated, and it is, inshallah, absolutely safe. Hepatitis A and E are both spread by fecal oral route. Hepatitis A has been reported to increase the risk of placental abruption and premature delivery. Hepatitis E is more likely to cause severe disease during pregnancy and may result in a case fatality ratio from 15 to 30% when acquired during the third trimester. It's also associated with fetal complications and fetal death. Some foodborne illness of particular concern during pregnancy include toxoplasmosis, listeriosis. The risk during pregnancy is that the infection will cross the placenta and cause multiple complications such as spontaneous abortion, stillbirth, congenital or neonatal infection. Pregnant travelers should be warned, therefore, to avoid unpasteurized cheese and undercooked meat products. Risk of fetal infection increase with gestational age, but the severity of infection is decreased. Parasitic disease is less common. And I would like here to add uh, a point of, uh, about uh, food allergy. Not only food poisoning can cause complication, because if any pregnant woman has allergy to certain food components, she, she should be aware of the component of all the food she can order or eat when she is abroad. A pregnant woman should avoid mosquito bites when traveling in area where vector-borne disease are endemic. As just uh, Dr. Babar mentioned, a preventive uh, measure uh, for mosquito bites is the primary, the primary action she must take. Uh, 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 also the chemoprophylaxis in some cases. A preventive measure include use of bed nets, insect repellent, and protective clothing. Uh, there is some point about Zika virus uh, is spread primarily through the bite of an infected mosquito. It can also be sexually transmitted. If a travel cannot be avoided, a pregnant woman should strictly follow steps to prevent mosquito bites. I will not uh, mention so much about malaria prophylaxis because it's only uh, it's already mentioned uh, excellently by Dr. Babar in the previous uh, presentation. Uh, I will just mention some points regarding pregnancy. Malaria may be much more serious in a pregnant than in non-pregnant woman and is associated with high risk of illness, 
and death for both mother and child. Malaria in pregnancy may be characterized by heavy parasitemia, severe anemia, and sometimes profound hypoglycemia may be complicated by cerebral malaria and acute respiratory distress syndrome. A placental sequestration of parasite may result in fetal loss due to abruption, premature labor, or miscarriage. An infant born to an infected mother is prone to be of low birth weight, and although rare, congenital malaria is of concern. Because no prophylactic regimen provides complete protection, as already mentioned, uh, pregnant women should avoid or delay travel to malaria endemic area. However, if travel is unavoidable, pregnant women should take precautions to avoid mosquito bites, as already mentioned. And I think that Dr. Babar mentioned all the safe medication that can be used during the pregnancy. Vaccines. In the best possible scenario, a woman should be up to date on routine vaccination before she becomes pregnant. The most effective way of protecting the infant against many disease is to immunize the mother. Tetanus, diphtheria, and pertussis Tdap vaccine, which is available in all hospital of MOH, should be given during each pregnancy, irrespective of the woman's history of receiving Tdap. To maximize maternal antibody response and passive antibody transfer to the infant, Optimal timing for Tdap administration is between 27 and 36 weeks of gestation, although it may be given at any time during the pregnancy. Annual influenza vaccine inactivated virus is recommended during any trimester for all women who are or will be pregnant during influenza season. For travelers, vaccination is recommended more than two weeks before departure if vaccine is available. Certain vaccines, including meningococcal, hepatitis A, B, that are considered safe during pregnancy may be indicated based on the risk. No adverse effect of inactivated polio vaccine have been documented among pregnant women or their fetuses. However, vaccination of pregnant women should be avoided because of theoretical concern. Rabies, post-exposure prophylaxis with rabies immunoglobulin and vaccine should be administered after moderate or high risk exposure to rabies. Pre-exposure vaccine may be considered for travelers when the, higher, when the risk of exposure is substantial. Most live virus vaccines, including measles, mumps, rubella vaccine, varicella vaccine, and live attenuated influenza vaccine are contraindicated during pregnancy. The exception is yellow fever vaccine for which a pregnancy is considered a precaution by the Advisory Committee on Immunization Practices. If a travel is unavoidable and the risk of yellow fever virus exposure are felt to outweigh the risk of vaccination, a pregnant woman should be vaccinated. Post-exposure prophylaxis of a non-immune pregnant woman exposed to measles or varicella may be provided by administering immunoglobulin within six days for measles or varicella zoster Ig within 10 days for varicella. Women planning to become pregnant should be advised to wait four weeks after receipt of a live virus, virus vaccine before conceiving. For certain travel-related vaccines, including Japanese encephalitis vaccine and typhoid vaccine, data are insufficient for a specific recommendation for use in a pregnant woman. A summary of the current guideline for vaccinating pregnant women is available in their website. Uh, this table is from a website up to date showing uh, the type of vaccine uh, and all the type that can be given in a pregnancy or contraindicated during a pregnancy and it's available there. Also, uh, this table from MOH, Wazara Tassaha website that show nicely also same information of the type of liqahat al-daruriya lil-mar'a qabl wa athna wa ba'd al-hamal wa mawjood fiha jami' al-ma'lumat b-shakil jameel jiddan wa mufassal. At last, I will not talk much about 
COVID-19 because already we have a lecture about it. Uh, it will be by, presented by Dr. Ibrahim Zahrani later. But there is one concern always pregnant women, uh, they are asking uh, in OBD, which is vaccination against COVID-19. Many pregnant women uh, in any trimester, they are really afraid to receive the vaccine. Though, uh, especially us in Qatif Central Hospital, which we dealt with the uh, bulk and most of the cases of the COVID-19 pregnant women in uh, Eastern region, we saw that uh, complication of uh, COVID-19 in a pregnancy can, lead, can be fatal and can lead to really many complications and premature delivery, which can be prevented by Allah if a pregnant woman receive vaccination. So I put here from the Ministry of Health website, سؤال اللي ممكن ينطرح من أي امرأة حامل والمفروض أي ممارس صحي يقدر أنه يجاوب عليه وبكل ثقة ومصداقية هل اللقاح آمن للحامل والمرضع وهل ينبغي تأجيل الحمل بعد تلقي اللقاح والجواب بناء على الدراسات والتوصيات العلمية الحديثة العالمية فإنه لا مانع من إعطاء لقاح فيروس كورونا للمرأة الحامل ولا ينبغي تأجيل الحمل بعد أخذ اللقاح كما لا يعتقد أن اللقاح يشكل خطرا على الرضاعة الطبيعية ويوصى بإعطاء اللقاح للمرضعات إذا لم يكن لديهن موانع للتطعيم which is nicely said that pregnant women can receive uh, the COVID-19 vaccination uh, safely and there is uh, many studies international that support that, uh, even lactational woman, she can receive it, inshallah, without any complication. And we must really, uh, in this era of increasing number again and again of COVID-19 uh, pandemic to stress on our um, uh, family members or patient uh, that go into pregnancy that she must receive it to prevent all the catastrophe that can uh, happen from losing two life. Uh, last, I would like to thank uh, everybody, especially audience for their good listening. And this is my home message. وَوَصَّيْنَا الْإِنسَانَ بِوَالِدَيْهِ حَمَلَتْهُ أُمُّهُ وَهْنًا عَلَى وَهْنٍ وَفِصَالُهُ فِي عَامَيْنِ أَنِشْكُرْ لِي وَلِوَالِدَيْكَ إِلَيَّ الْمَصِيرِ Thank you again. Uh, thanks a lot, Victorian, for uh, this nice and uh, to the point picture, uh, which concentrate an important point, uh, which we have to consider it and uh, put it in our mind as a healthcare provider when we provide the travel counseling to a pregnant lady. Uh, really, thank you for this informative uh, lecture. Uh, now, if you allow me, I will uh, give the audience a chance to ask their question. Of course, Victor Aro, at Fabuli. Uh, the first question is, uh, is there uh, any risk to pregnant women during car travel for long distance? Um, more or less, it has the same complication that we mentioned from trauma. And I remember very well, uh, I think, uh, Dr. Babar yesterday, when he mentioned that most of the fatality during the travel, it was from motor uh, vehicle accident, as I remember. So still, she had this hazard, uh, and there is less hazard from DVT if she is not moving her leg for a long time. And of course, when she will travel to the area, she will travel uh, like communicable disease or food poisoning, eating outside, the other risk we mentioned. Thank you, Victoria. Uh, Victoria, uh, I, have a, I have a question here. Uh, Dr. Reem, what is the 
ردي على الإشاعات أيوة التي تعجز أيوة. الرأي أولا شكرا جزيلا على طرح السؤال لأن يعني أنا حاولت بقدر المستطاع I tried really my best and يعني uh, you can imagine us as an obstetrician that we have uh, to be really honest because this patient they are coming and يعني directly asking us when she is in first or second trimester when it is critical for organogenesis يعني مرحلة اللي فعلا هي مهمة يعني لتكون الجنين وبعض المرضى يعني يجون بمخاوف حقيقية من تلقي اللقاح فالإنسان يشعر بأمانة طبعا في لما يجاوب على هذه الأسئلة ولكن حسب الدراسات اللي احنا مؤمنين فيها عالميا وانترناشنال وبروفن فعلا أن بإذن الله اللقاح فعلا آمن وحسب الممارسة إحنا يعني من يوم يعني بدأت البانديميك أو الجائحة جميع الحوامل اللي تلقوا اللقاح لحد الآن الحمد لله we did not see any complication during pregnancy so إن شاء الله أن الوضع آمن وأن الإنسان أز يعني ممارس صحي ممكن يطمنهم بإذن الله أن اللقاح إن شاء الله ما يشكل أي مشكلة عليهم شكرا جزيلا دكتورة Uh, yeah. You mentioned uh, about uh, rabies prophylaxis in uh, pregnancy. Uh, mm-hmm. Is it the same uh, chemical prophylaxis used as the uh, prophylaxis used in non-pregnant uh, patients? Uh, well, actually, Anna, Hada, I will refer this question to the mukhtasin. If it's possible, Dr. Sumaya or Dr. Babar, I will because I'm not uh, expert in rabies exposure. or chemoprophylaxis. Uh, Dr. Babar? Uh, yes, Dr. Ra'a. Yes, can you repeat the question, please? Dr. Uh, uh, Dr. Uh, Dr. Ra'a, you mentioned about the rabies uh, prophylaxis in pregnant uh, yes. lady. Is it the same uh, as in non-pregnant uh, individual, or is there any difference between Yes, the same. The same vaccine that we give it to the um, non-pregnant ladies. Okay, agree. Thank you, Doctor. Thank you. Uh, uh, here another question: uh, How many months in pregnancy can still travel? Uh, according, طبعا uh, to the airline. يعني حسب airline, most of them uh, up. till 36 weeks of gestation ولكن كل ايرلاين ممكن يختلف عن الثاني يعني ممكن لما تكون الترافل مثلا مسافه بعيده ممكن يتغير و they are not committing يعني البريجنت وومن تو ترافل سو ماي انسر از اكوردنج تو ذا بوليسي اوف ذيس سبيسيفيك ايرلاين بت موست اوف ذيم تيل 36 of gestation Thank you, Dr. Reem. Uh, I wonder if there is uh, any other question from uh, my great audience. Please feel free to ask. Uh, are all type of uh, COVID vaccine safe in pregnancy, especially uh, AZ, uh, which caused some clotting reported? Some clotting reported? Uh, I'm not aware of the uh, يعني detailed information of each component of vaccine. But as uh, a vaccine provided by MOH, yes, it is safe. Mm, thank you, Dr. Uh, here another question. Uh, can malaria treatment affect, uh, affect for pregnancy? Again, please. Malaria treatment can affect for pregnancy. Malaria treatment? Yes, can affect pregnancy. No, it is absolutely safe. Absolutely safe. Yani, malaria itself, it's the problem. Yani, if she, if uh, any pregnant woman will encounter the disease, because, yeah, she might have a critical complication. Okay, good. Uh, thank you, Dr. Reem. Is there any other question? Uh, we'll give them a couple of uh, minutes. 
please, if you have any question, uh, use the question box and feel free to ask. Uh, either the Tarim and the other speaker all are uh, around and they will, inshallah, will fix you. Repeated question about the duration for travel. I think uh, Dr. Gharib or uh, Gharib Salem repeated yeah, the question. Uh, and uh, I said, depend on the airline, but most of them uh, they will allow till 36 weeks. Yeah, I think no more question, uh, Dr. Arim. Okay, thank you so much. Thanks a lot, thanks a lot Dr. Arim, for uh, this informative lecture again. Thank you so much. Uh, my dear audience, I uh, think uh, by the end of this uh, lecture, we will take uh, a brief break for uh, 15 minutes. And uh, we will uh, come back again after that, inshallah, to start again uh, with Dr. Ibrahim Zahrani, how we love it. For now, we will start the break, okay, for 10 minutes, about 15 minutes, and we will return back, inshallah.
Uh, okay, my respected audience and the speaker, we will uh, restart now, inshallah. Uh, we'll come uh, back uh, again after this uh, brief break for uh, refreshment and uh, stretching. Uh, hopefully you enjoy with us during uh, this morning. Uh, my great audience, let me uh, introduce to you uh, our next speaker, uh, Dr. Ibrahim Zahrani, Chief of uh, Public and Preventive uh, Medicine at Eastern Health Cluster who will present to us uh, one of the most important uh, topic arising now on the floor. Uh, he will talk to us, inshallah, about uh, COVID-19 and travel. Uh, welcome, uh, Dr. Ibrahim. Uh, please take the lead. Thank you, Dr. لا والصلاة والسلام على أشرف الأنبياء والمرسلين أشكر حقيقة أشكركم زملائنا في الجبيل أشكركم شبكة الجبيل الصحية على اهتمامكم بهذا الموضوع I think it is the first time to have like this conference covering traveling medicine Thank you دكتورة آمنة By the way دكتورة آمنة she is the supervisor of medical clinic in I mean traveling clinic in Eastern Health Cluster So thank you, Dr. Amina, for this interesting issue. Thank you for the topic you chose. Uh, I think the most interesting topic I hear today is the uh, pregnancy and what, how to deal with pregnancy and what advice you should provide to pregnant lady if she decided to, uh, to travel. I think also, uh, and this is my request or my advice to Dr. Amina to, uh, to add this uh, important issue. Uh, if she, uh, I know she is uh, going, inshallah, to, uh, to 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 make or to develop, and uh, uh, I mean something uh, we can use for the traveling clinic, uh, something uh, booklet or some uh, brief instruction for our colleague in uh, traveling clinic regarding different issue. And one is uh, uh, important issue. Uh, personally, I think it is important. Uh, I learn a lot today from Dr. Reem. Uh, thank you a lot, Dr. Reem, for this uh, nice topic, for nice coverage of the important issues uh, regarding pregnancy. I think a pregnant, uh, when a pregnant lady came to us in traveling uh, clinic, it was a very a difficult issue because you know pregnancy is a difficult time many medication many vaccination uh, medical legally uh, not tested during the pregnancy so again we are uh, worried uh, whether to give this vaccine whether to start this medication or not so i think it is important uh, from uh, my side to take care of this Dr. Amina, uh, to make it in our uh, manual for traveling clinic, Bidinlai Ta'ala. Bidinlah, Dr. Bidinlah. And Dr. We are thank ready to accept any improvement. idea, for yeah, any idea, for really. This, for this improvement, also for our travel clinic. Thank you, Dr. Yeah. Well, uh, okay, I will start my sharing of screen. Uh, I hope it will be perfect, inshallah. So is it okay, Dr. Aroa? Yes, Dr. Yeah, just to introduce myself, Dr. Uh, told that I am Dr. Ibrahim Zahrani. I am an epidemiologist. I am chief of public health and also a director uh, for preventive medicine in the Eastern Health Cluster. I am the leader for the COVID vaccine uh, vaccination site in the Eastern region also. I worked before during the uh, initial time or the beginning of the COVID uh, in the beginning of 2020. I was a leader for the medical team in King Fahad International Airport uh, for six months. So inshallah, I will go back for, the, uh, for that uh, time, maybe two and a half years uh, back what happened exactly uh, in that time. 
I am telling always that COVID vaccine, although it is uh, so bad, we face a very difficult time we have ever uh, seen before or faced before. It has a, a bright side. We learn a lot from uh, COVID. We uh, practice a lot of uh, things that we we learn, but we never uh, practicing before. Uh, we know more about quarantine. We know about isolation, about uh, contact tracing, uh, what happened really in pandemic, what is the meaning of uh, flight ban, everything we learn from uh, COVID. Uh, so COVID, uh, as all of us, we know, Okay, okay, okay. This slide, I think uh, our colleague in Jubail, they put it and they request us to, 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 uh, to keep it uh, in our presentation. Uh, personally, it is important really, since I am one of the leader of the Eastern Health Cluster. So my message to uh, all of my colleagues in the Eastern Health Cluster and to all of our colleagues, I know uh, most of the participants are from the Eastern Health Cluster. So this is our vision in the Eastern Health Cluster uh, is to perform or transform uh, into a world-class healthcare provider for comprehensive human-centric care. So it is a transformation to human-centric care. Uh, if we take a uh, traveling uh, medicine as a part, I think this uh, conference is one of our uh, is, is one of our uh, I mean plan to improve or to transformation for this uh, traveling uh, clinic. The message of uh, Eastern Health Cluster, and I think it is the message of each member of us, is to provide or deliver prevention and accessible integrated care through a safe sustainable and innovative system, resulting in improving primary care and enabling people to take ownership of their own health. So if you, if you look, we start with prevention. So prevention is most important issue. And I think the one who uh, start the policy or the strategy for the Eastern Health Cluster, they, uh, they take more concern about prevention. Uh, and this is one of our uh, prevention uh, site is the traveling clinic. I'm always telling that, and I told it, it, till it yesterday regarding uh, our situation in case A. We are not, uh, not like other countries. We have the two custodian, and we have maybe a third of our population coming from outside uh, the country. So I think we are, unless we have a good prevention and a good surveillance system. Our values in uh, Houston Health Cluster is innovation, empowerment, efficiency, and accountability. I think this should be the value for each one uh, of us in the Eastern Health Cluster or outside the health cluster. If you go back two and a half years uh, at the initial uh, time and uh, at the end of uh, 2019, uh, a cluster of Yomun of unknown etiology was reported in Wuhan City, China. At that time, nobody uh, was giving that uh, cluster of pneumonia concern. We were all heard uh, it in the media, but nobody think that it will end up with uh, a pandemic like what happened during the last two years. Again, the cases uh, continue to occur. On 9 of January, Chinese authorities reported in the media that the cause of this viral pneumonia was initially identified as a new type of coronavirus which is different from any other human coronaviruses discovered so far. Again, we continue just to observe the situation, to uh, make strong surveillance in China, to trace the cases, to make more study about the behavior of this virus. But at that time, uh, no, no, yeah, no restriction was done for traveling uh, during the COVID-19 pandemic. International traffic was prioritized for emergencies and humanitarian actions. Travel of essential personnel, repatriation, and cargo transport for essential supplies such as food, medicine, and fuel. Uh, it is important for uh, for the flight to continue uh, traveling between countries because if you make any restriction many things will be affected uh, and many things important for the life of the uh, persons in different country. 
as countries gradually resume the international travel introduction of risk mitigation measures aiming to reduce travel associated exportation, importation, and onward transmission of SARS cov 2 should not unnecessarily interfere with international traffic and should be based on a thrift risk assessment that is conducted systematically and routinely. So this is the recommendation from the WHO regarding when to uh, ban the flight, ban transportation between countries, and if you ban it and you want to resume uh, international traffic. Again, the recommendation for WHO is the following factors should be considered for all countries. The local epidemiology in departure and destination countries should be strong. Traffic volumes between countries should be evaluated. The public, public health and health services capacity and performance to detect and care for cases and their contact, including among travelers in the destination country. Public health and social measures implemented to control the spread of COVID-19 in departure and destination countries and available evidence on adherence and effectiveness of such measure in reducing transmission. Other factors, including economic impact, human rights, and feasibility of applying measures, among others. So all of these factors should be countries for all, should be uh, considered for all countries. The recommendation from WHO at that time, initially, uh, uh, for international travelers, travelers is to practice usual precautions. I think this usual precaution is applicable uh, and it is valid for any uh, communicable disease if it's going to be a pandemic or any outbreak is going to happen. So this practice, this precaution uh, is a valid for any communicable disease and we can apply for any communicable disease. The first of all is to avoid close contact with people suffering from acute respiratory infections, frequent hand washing, especially after direct contact with ill people or their environment. Travelers with symptoms of acute respiratory infection should practice cough adequate maintain distance, cover cuff and sneeze with disposable tissue or clothing and wash hands. Health practitioners and public health authorities should provide to travelers information to reduce the general risk of acute respiratory infections via travel uh, health clinics, travel agency, convenience operators and at points of interest. A passenger locator form can be used in if into a sick traveler detected on a board plane this form is usually useful for collecting contact information for passengers and can be used for follow-up if necessary. Travelers should also be encouraged to self-report if they feel ill. This instruction was initiated by WHO at the beginning of this uh, pandemic. This is the first recommendation from the uh, WHO for international traffic. It was on 10th of January, in the beginning of the pandemic, before even it spread over the, the whole world. Uh, again, the recommendation of WHO uh, was going online with uh, the uh, new data about the virus, new update, new knowledge about the behavior of the virus. And because at that time there were no report of cases outside of Wuhan city, WHO doesn't recommend any specific health measures for travelers. In case of symptoms suggestive to respiratory illness before, during, or after travel, the travelers are encouraged to seek medical attention and share travel history with their health care provider. As provided by the International uh, Health Regulation, uh, IHR, countries should ensure that uh, this distributed to all countries at that time, and they request all countries to do uh, the following recommendation, starting by routine measures, train the staff, appropriate space and stock bill of adequate equipment in place and points of entry for assessing and managing ill travelers detected before travel on board conferences, such as plane and ship, and on arrival at point of entry. So all the step of the journey, starting from uh, the country uh, during uh, the journey and on arrival to the destination. Procedure and means are in place for communicating information on ill travelers between conferences and points of entry, as well as between points of entry and national health authorities. Safe transportation of symptomatic travelers to hospital or designated facilities for clinical assessment and treatment is organized. A functional public health emergency contingency plan at points of entry in place to respond to public health events. 
At this time, no recommendation was there to do any uh, restriction for the uh, flight. All the instruction, all the recommendation from WHO to the countries is to, to be ready, uh, to be fit enough to, uh, to respond as fast as possible if there is any uh, spreading for the virus in their country. But at that time, as I mentioned, the virus was uh, only in Wuhan, still not spread to other country. After two weeks, on 24th of January, traffic-related cases linked to Wuhan City have been reported in several countries. Now the fires start to spread to other countries, and human-to-human -human transmission has been confirmed largely in Wuhan City, but also some other places in China and internationally. It was not unexpected that new confirmed cases will continue to appear in other areas and countries. So the virus was expected at that time to be uh, uh, to appear in other uh, area and countries. So WHO now started to, to think more uh, sophisticated measures to be taken. With the information available for the novel coronavirus, WHO advises that measures to limit the risk of exportation or importation of the disease should be implemented without unnecessary restriction of international traffic. Still, they were not thinking to restrict the uh, international uh, traffic or the flight between uh, countries. Because as I mentioned it before, uh, to ban any uh, travel between countries, it affects a lot of issues, economic, it affects human, it affects tourists, any, anything related to traveling will be affected. Uh, according to this action, if uh, they took it. So they were very hesitating in taking this action. They were waiting, uh, surfing the situation, uh, and they only giving instruction to the countries uh, to do their own uh, precautions. And there was a two advice, one advice for exit screening in countries or area with ongoing transmission of the novel coronavirus, at that time, People Republic of China, I remember the international, King Fad International Airport, they were doing at that time only checking for the coming uh, travelers coming from uh, China. They are checking their temperature, they are uh, doing physical, uh, visual examination for them, uh, looking for any uh, sick uh, traveler come in that flight. Uh, the advice also for entry screening in countries area without transmission of the novel coronavirus. WHO advice against the, the application of any restriction of international traffic. So still uh, no restriction for international traffic. So what was what were, uh, was the advice for exit screening in countries uh, or area with ongoing transportation of the novel at that time, People Republic of China? Uh, they advised them to conduct exit screening at international airport and board in the affected area with the aims early detection of symptomatic travelers. So uh, this action is to detect early any symptomatic traveler, to isolate him, prevent him uh, even from uh, taking this flight to other country. Uh, they checked for signs and symptoms. Uh, they were uh, considering fever above 38 and they consider also cough. Interview of passenger with respiratory infection, directing symptomatic travelers to further medical examination, followed by testing for uh, COVID virus, and keeping confirmed cases under isolation and treatment. So this action will, will minimize the spread of uh, infection or the spread of this virus to other uh, zero cases countries. Uh, travelers who had contact with confirmed cases or direct exposure to potential source of infection should be placed under medical observation also. They were on, not only considering the patient, they add to the patient the contact uh, or the contact with confirmed, we call it high risk uh, contact. Uh, high risk contact should avoid travel for the duration of the incubation period up to 14 days at that time. Uh, they were uh, including this incubation period. For the entry, uh, I mean, for the, 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 the countries that receive the travelers or uh, uh, the, the entry point, uh, their advice is to do entry screening uh, without in the countries without transmission of the novel coronavirus. Uh, the risk of importation of the disease may be reduced if temperature screening at entry is associated with early detection of symptomatic passenger and their referral for medical follow-up. 
Temperature screening should always be accompanied by dissemination of risk communication message at points of entry. This can be done through posters, leaflet, electronic bulletin, etc., aiming at raising awareness among travelers about signs and symptoms of the disease and encouragement of healthcare seeking behavior, including when to seek medical care and report of their travel history. Still, no guarantee, uh, no restriction for any flight at this time. They were only instructing the countries, they were only instructing the people traveling, they were only observing uh, the travelers for any symptoms uh, before travel and after travel when they reached to other country with zero cases. So all this action were uh, performed at this, at this time. Public health authorities should reinforce collaboration with airlines operators for case management on board aircraft and reporting should a traveler with respiratory disease symptoms is detected. Again, they include the airlines with them. Uh, the communication with the airlines team should be uh, clear uh, to the operator of the airlines, to the public health authorities in the countries. So everything they were preparing at that time uh, and they were expecting at that time uh, uh, not to uh, spread the virus more and more. After two weeks, even on 11th of February, countries should be, they advise the countries. Now the, the, the virus start to spread more and more. And they start to think of international uh, traffic uh, restriction or ban the flight. So they request all countries uh, to be prepared for containment, including active surveillance, early detection, isolation and case management, contact tracing and prevention of onward spread of coronavirus infection and to share full data with WHO. I think most of us uh, presenting here, we practice or we did uh, this thing. We, we did active surveillance uh, aiming for early detection. We, uh, we share uh, for isolation and for case management. We share in contact tracing and prevention of onward uh, spread of infection. Uh, the data uh, was shared also through Ministry of Health with WHO. So at that time, the BOTA measures to be adopted before departure, advanced bilateral communication, coordination and planning with the responsible authorities before departure. There was a bilateral communication between the countries uh, and coordination and planning uh, between the countries, they start uh, to implement. The aircraft should be properly staffed with sufficient medical personnel. This is their advice to the aircraft. The non-medical crew of the aircraft should be properly briefed and outfitted, as well as aware of the signs and symptoms to detect symptomatic passenger for the virus. Exit screening also before departure. It is advised to delay the travel of the suspected ill travelers detected through exit screening to be referred for further evaluation and treatment. Now, the, 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 the measures taken became more uh, strong uh, because of the spread of the virus was at that time spreading very fast. Uh, a lot of countries uh, affected at that time. So now they start to uh, make more uh, sophisticated uh, measures. On board the aircraft also, the sitting location of the passenger inside the aircraft should be duly noted and mapped. Just in case one of the passenger was having symptoms, uh, they can design it, uh, they, they can, I mean, they can trace this patient, they can trace uh, their contact. So uh, if there is any case suspected on the aircraft, they, they should assign it one dedicated cabin crew member to look after the ill traveler, use appropriate personal protective equipment when dealing with symptomatic patient. In all cases, the adjacent seat of the patient should be left unoccupied if feasible. Uh, this, is, uh, uh, this is actually uh, was their recommendation to the aircraft. Uh, we were doing, we were following also in the King Fahd International with the airlines to make sure everything is uh, going with the WHO instruction. Again, passenger in the onboard the aircraft, passengers seated in the closed facility should have their information on itinerary and contact detail recorded for further follow-up as potential contact using a passenger locator form. 
the patient on the aircraft should adhere to respiratory cuff precautions measures, practice hand hygiene, hand it always in accordance with the regulatory uh, requirement and guidelines, notify the health authority at the point of arrival if there is any case was suspecting during the journey, and not only that, we have to, uh, to tell them the seat where this suspected case was uh, seated and what are the uh, nearby passengers just to, uh, to make sure and uh, to follow uh, this uh, case and his contact. Uh, notify the health authority at the point of arrival, ensure the flight crew maintain continuous operation of the aircraft's air recirculation system, uh, HIPAA filters are fitted to most large aircraft and will remove some airborne pathogen depending on the size of the particulate or microorganism. So all of the aircraft were uh, equipped with this HIPAA filter uh, to minimize uh, the spread of that uh, virus inside the aircraft. Upon arrival at the point of entry, this is the recommendation is to do entry screening, temperature screening. It should be accompanied with health messages, dissemination of health message and travel notice informing person on signs, symptoms and where to seek medical support if needed. At that time, nobody, uh, I think uh, the disease was not clear uh, for all of the population. So, uh, it is a must to educate uh, travelers about the signs and symptoms of that disease uh, to advise them if, if they feel any symptoms to uh, seek medical advice and to isolate themselves from others. Just all of these measures taken to, to minimize the spread of infection. Uh, primary questionnaire development and use of form to collect information on symptoms, history of exposure and contact information. Data collection analysis, establishment of proper mechanism for collection and analysis of data generated from the entry screening for the rapid evaluation and response. I remember at that time, uh, my team were requested to register all the passenger coming from uh, some of the countries that with high uh, prevalence or the high incidence of the uh, COVID, uh, COVID virus uh, confirmed there. Now at this time, they start to think of guarantee. And some countries, they start actually at this time to do a guarantee for the uh, patient uh, and for the coming uh, passenger from uh, affected area. If the country decide to put arriving passengers does not display symptoms in a guarantee facility, the following need to be considered in accordance with Article 32 of the International Health Regulation. Uh, the infrastructure space should be respected not to further enhance potential transmission. This is the, the, the requirement from WHO for the guarantee. Uh, if any country decide to do a guarantee for the uh, coming or the arriving passenger, we know guarantee for the uh, asymptomatic or a passenger that we are suspecting he uh, may have or may have carried the virus and he is still in the incubation period, we have to put him in guarantee till the picture is clear. If after two weeks end without any symptoms, now we can end the guarantee and the passenger or the new arrival can go out of this guarantee. So this is the criteria, the infrastructure, uh, space should be respected, not to further enhance potential transmission. Accommodation and supply, travelers should be provided with adequate food and water appropriate accommodation, including sleeping uh, arrangement and clothing protection for baggage and other uh, positions. Communication, establish appropriate communication channel to avoid panic and to provide appropriate health message so those guarantee can timely seek appropriate care when developing symptoms. Respect and dignity, travelers should be treated with respect for their dignity, human rights and fundamental freedoms and minimize any discomfort or distress. Duration up to 14 days corresponding with the known incubation period of the virus, according to existing information, may be extended due to delayed exposure. Upon arrival at the point of entry, entry screening, temperature screening, it should be accompanied with health message, dissemination of health message and travel notice informing person on signs, symptoms, and where to seek medical support if needed. Primary questionnaire, development and use of form to collect information on symptoms. 
data collection and analysis. I think I go back for the, for the my slide. Uh, now, uh, after the guarantee uh, on 29th of February, I think in our country, we start uh, restriction for the flight on 29th of February. Uh, at that time, WHO continued to advise against the application of travel, travel or trade restriction to countries experiencing COVID-19 outbreak. Recommendation for international travelers is it is important for travelers who are at high risk to delay or avoid travel to an affected area. Travelers returning from affected area should self-monitor for symptoms for 14 days and national protocol of receiving countries. Some countries may require returning travelers to enter guarantee. Uh, we were uh, uh, in KC, uh, one of that uh, country, we start guaranteeing at that time for uh, not for all travelers, for some travelers coming from uh, high endemic uh, countries. Beginning of March, uh, travel uh, restriction started. Many countries and region imposed guarantees entry bans or other traffic restriction for citizen or recent traveler to the most affected area. Some countries and region imposed global restriction that apply to all foreign countries and territories or prevent their own citizen from traveling overseas. Traffic restrictions reduced the spread of the virus, but because they were first implemented after community spread was established, in multiple countries in different regions of the world, they produced only a modest reduction in the total number of people infected. But still, it is uh, effective to reduce uh, the spread of the virus or to bring the virus from outside. Travel restriction may be most important at the start and end of the pandemic. The travel restriction both a significant economic cost to the global tourism industry through lost income and social harm to people who were unable to travel internationally. And this, I think, the most important issue why they were thinking late in doing a travel restriction. And they were, we, we started with uh, different measures. Uh, they took different measures before they did a uh, travel restriction. This is the situation was at that time. At this time, this is the situation in the airport. Nobody was there. I hope, inshallah, we will not face like this uh, in the future, uh, uh, no travel and no flight, the air board were empty, nobody was there, uh, difficult life uh, as the picture uh, here, this is the ta at that time when there were a uh, flight ban. This is a picture what they were doing in the aircraft. Uh, they were, um, some of the countries, they were very restricted in making the mask, the face shield, and the distancing uh, between the uh, passenger. And this is a picture for the, uh, disinfecting the aircraft after each flight. This is actually one of the uh, paper we were uh, receiving from uh, MOH. They were updating us. This was on 9 of March. And this is the, the, the first uh, starting, uh, the guarantee. This is the, 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 the first uh, action we have to take for some countries. This is the second, it is, and this is the third. The first for the uh, guarantee, health guarantee, uh, and the second for the home isolation. This is the countries they were selected because they were highly endemic with the virus. The virus was with high incidence in those countries, starting with China, Italy, South Korea, Iran, Japan, France. All of these countries uh, we were updating from MOH to do this action with them, and we were doing. We did this action. We any any passenger came from these countries, we uh, shift him directly to the uh, guarantee. Uh, other countries they were selected because they were having moderate uh, spread of the virus, like Egypt, uh, Lebanon, Syria, Iraq. They were do we were doing only uh, home isolation. Actually, we uh, take the names of those their data and we advise them for home isolation. Uh, the data usually we share it with other 
government department to trace uh, those passenger whether they are restricted uh, or they are compliant with the isolation or not. And for any passenger came with symptoms, usually we were instructed to shift him to the uh, hospital. This is the update. Again, we were receiving update frequently, sometimes daily, sometimes each other day, sometimes weekly. So according to the update we received from WHO uh, upon the um, new, uh, I mean, new uh, countries that uh, become highly endemic, uh, we added to the quarantine. Um, later on, uh, some countries we added to the isolation. So. Every time they are updating us with uh, with the countries that uh, traveler coming from to put them in quarantine or to put them in home uh, uh, quarantine. Again, uh, not all after that, maybe starting from uh, the 1st of March, they ban all the flight. They only allow for some flight for the uh, passengers uh, they brought from other countries, so the passenger only. So this is the flight we were receiving uh, frequently from the uh, Saudi airline department or from the Sherikit uh, Mutarat al-Dammam. They are giving us this schedule with the flight uh, coming. So. They were only flight. They allow for some flight to come from uh, some countries only for the uh, human issue for our people in other countries to uh, to come back to the country. And we used at that time, we put them in the quarantine directly for uh, two weeks. This is in the international, uh, King Fahd International Airport. This is a picture of uh, our team working there. Uh, it's clear here that all passengers, we keep them in, uh, in row. Um, and again, we pass them by the screen camera. We observing them. If anyone appear that he's having temperature, we will take him and isolate him from other passenger to evaluate him. If there was any need to transfer him to hospital, we will transfer him directly to the hospital. Again, we take the data from the people coming from some countries and they, they, they were a need to uh, do home uh, quarantine for them. Uh, we take the data and registering in our uh, data registry. Again, this is one picture. This, if you look to this bus starting uh, for the uh, moving the passengers to go to the quarantine. Actually, they were not allowed to go by themselves or they were not allowed to go by the relative, only allowed to take them by, uh, by us and to take them uh, directly to the quarantine. I think this is a video just to uh, go back uh, retrospectively to remember what was happened at that uh, time. Uh, Dr. Ibrahim, no pause in the video, if you have any pause in the video. Yeah, I'm a doctor. The video is going to be the على كل حال دكتورة روى يمكن الصوت ما كان واضح فقط أنا حبيت أشارككم الفيديو إيش اللي كان what was happening at that time and this is the half the bus they share with us the responsibility in doing quarantine all passenger coming they were taking by this buses and directly they put them in the quarantine hotels for a specific duration. Starting by two weeks, then uh, we they minimize it to 10 and to five to seven days. And we end up at that time, alhamdulillah, uh, we finish quarantine. Uh, this is a slide, actually, it is uh, not clear, but I can read it for you. This is uh, a trend of the COVID. And the action we're taking from uh, us, uh, if we look to the 
first uh, green flag, uh, it was for the school and university closure. The second green flag, it was for ban international travel. It was around 29th of uh, February, beginning days of March. Again, we continue in this ban. Uh, not all flights allowed to enter the country, special flight for specific special uh, situation, special consideration, they were allowed to enter the countries and all the passenger coming, they were put in the quarantine. We continue like this till the beginning of September to 2021, when they reopen uh, portal of entry and back to normal life, uh, maybe on the beginning before two, uh, two months, I think it was in between March and April, uh, back to normal uh, life. And this is the final, uh, uh, I mean, the final uh, paper from Wiqaya regarding the instruction, going back to normal situation, Alhamdulillah, uh, after we uh, left with uh, COVID vaccine, we face all uh, difficult uh, situation with that COVID vaccine. We practice a lot of our uh, preventive measures from starting from uh, entry point, screening the passenger coming, from taking the data, from uh, isolation for the patient, for guaranteeing for the suspected uh, passenger they are coming from high risk uh, country. Uh, we learn at that time how to do a quarantine, what to do during quarantine, what duration you have to consider for quarantine, what is the incubation period, what is the isolation, what, what is the quarantine. Actually, we learn a lot from COVID, what is the contact tracing, and we're practicing this issue for you all as a public health uh, team. So, Alhamdulillah, عدنا إلى الحياة الطبيعية بعد معاناة كبيرة. Uh, well, I'll take you to the end of the day, I'll take you to if I uh, take a long time, because this instruction, I think it is important to know, uh, it is valid for any uh, pandemic, inshallah, it will not occur, but it is valid for any uh, pandemic or any outbreak or any uh, communicable disease emerging uh, like COVID uh, virus. I'll take you to uh, I finish my lecture if there is any uh, question or comment. Uh, thanks a lot, uh, for Ibrahim, for uh, this very nice presentation. Uh, actually, he took out with uh, you in a well organized journey and nicely summarized the, uh, in a timeline manner uh, the travel related international traffic rules, uh, global and local measures, and precautions that had been implemented. Uh, since COVID pandemic started until we uh, back to normal life, alhamdulillah. Uh, thank you again, uh, Dr. Ibrahim, for uh, this very, very nice presentation. Thank you, Dr. Uh, maybe uh, I'll ask uh, the audience now if you have any questions, we can take it now. Uh, Dr. Ibrahim, we will give them a couple of minutes, insha'Allah, to see if there is any uh, question from them regarding this presentation. Okay, there is a question from uh, Sahar uh, Mustafa uh, related to vaccination. Because of the large number of vaccination, some time required for one trip, what is the vaccination allowed to be taken together and uh, the other uh, requiring a period between the two vaccines? Okay, can I answer, uh, Dr. Arua? Uh, sorry, Dr. Ibrahim. Yeah, can I answer the question? Yes, for, uh, for sure. Dr. Yeah. Okay, this is uh, recommended for all vaccine. If we have a life attenuated vaccine, uh, the only to keep uh, duration between two life attenuated vaccine if we are not taken at the same time. 
other vaccine you can take uh, at any time with, after, before, no problem, especially the inactivated vaccine. But for the life attenuated vaccine, if you uh, don't take them at the same time and you take life attenuated today and you want to take another life attenuated tomorrow, you have to keep uh, four weeks between those two life attenuated vaccine to avoid the period of uh, interferon because life attenuated usually uh, produce the, the immunity interferon. Interferon will decrease the activity of the second life attenuated if you uh, introduce after uh, the first life attenuated. For the life attenuated vaccine, usually we want this life attenuated vaccine to enter the body, nothing to interfere with its replication inside the body. One of the interfer uh, interference with the replication is the interferon, which will be produced during if you enter the first life attenuated. For other inactivated vaccine, you can give today, uh, you can give another one tomorrow, no problem and no need for any uh, duration between them. Hope I answer his question. Thanks a lot, Doctor. It was a positive uh, answer. Uh, the other question here uh, is: uh, Is it allowed to uh, to take fever vaccine and COVID nineteen in the same session? I don't know what he mean by fever vaccine. He mean yellow fever or? I think she mean yellow fever. Sahara Mustafa, uh, if you uh, allow me, please. Uh, you can rephrase your question. What yeah, yeah, you no problem. Yeah, no problem. He can take it, uh, Dr. Roa. If, if he mean yellow fever, but by the way, COVID-19 is inactivated, so you can take it with any other vaccine. Great. Uh, uh, here, uh, Khaled Zahrani. Uh, thank you, Dr. Ibrahim, for this nice lecture. Uh, now, uh, what about COVID precaution? Uh, we can say the pandemic is over. Where is this question, uh, Dr. Roa? Uh, Khalid Zahrani, first of all, he thank you, Dr. Ibrahim, for this nice lecture. And now he's asking, what about COVID precaution? Uh, we can say that now the pandemic is over. No, still, still. Still, but it is... Uh, I mean, um, become inshallah uh, less and less still we, we say that it is now uh, over, but still not announced by the WHO it is over. So we have to take uh, precaution, not all precaution. Now the precaution, uh, I mean, instructed by MOH is to uh, wear mask in uh, I think it is better to wear mask uh, in internal uh, situation. يعني في المناسبات الاجتماعية في الأسواق still طبعا recommended to wear a facial mask. The, by the way, we are facing nowadays increasing in the number of COVID uh, viruses, the activity. So I hope, inshallah, it will not uh, increase more and more. So my recommendation to all uh, of you presenting or participating in this conference and from you to other, uh, your families, to other uh, relatives, please advise them to keep on, uh, especially the facial mask, to keep distance as, as much as they can. Uh, not like before we are instructing to, it is uh, mandatory, but I think it is better to, uh, to continue with this instruction. Great, thanks a lot, Dr. Ibrahim. Uh, here is uh, another question from uh, Ahmed Abu Khair. Uh, I just would like to ask about the rate of critical case decrease significantly due to mass vaccination. But until when, uh, we will take poster dose. ترى صوتك يا دكتورة روى أسمع بصعوبة فلذلك أنا أفضل أقرأ من هنا من هو هذا أحمد أبو الخير ولا؟ أحمد أبو الخير أيوة ممتازة. Uh, thank you for your طيب uh, I just would like to ask about that rate of critical case decrease significantly الحمد لله uh, for sure decrease significantly due to mass vaccination but until when will uh, take booster dose I don't know والله I don't know. <laughs> I don't know, maybe, يعني personally, this is, uh, take it from me as a personal uh, opinion. I think they will keep it as, uh, as a seasonal vaccine, like uh, influenza vaccine. Still, wallahi, not, not clear the picture. And now they recommend the fourth 
uh, dose, what we call it the second booster dose for a special uh, group. Those group with uh, free low immunity, high risk group, and those above uh, 50 uh, years old, and eight months uh, after the third dose, they can take the fourth dose. Uh, but it is only recommended, it is not, uh, I mean, uh, mandatory, but uh, recommended, meaning that, inshallah, you will benefit uh, from this uh, second booster dose. Is there really Belgian vaccine that includes zero fever and COVID? Again, I don't know what do you what do you mean by zero fever? What is zero fever? I don't know like, what is this zero fever. I don't know about any Belgian vaccine that contain vaccine COVID-19 and other uh, vaccine. Um, to my knowledge, I don't know about this vaccine. What I know, all vaccine available contain COVID-19 vaccine only. Uh, I think the other already repeated the question, uh, but I will ask them uh, what, is the, uh, what is the appropriate uh, preventive uh, treatment uh, for malaria carrier if they travel to a place where malaria is prevalent? What is appropriate preventive? Uh, Dr. Uh, Babar, if he's present, can, can add his comment, but uh what is appropriate preventive treatment nothing called preventive treatment preventive i don't know preventive uh, measures maybe for malaria carrier if they travel to a place where malaria is prevalent very fake question but if i understand it uh, clearly any malaria carrier should be screened and should be treated we are not worried about this uh, malaria carrier. We are out, but worried about the people living in that country he visited because this carrier may be a source for this uh, malaria parasite. So what we are doing here, any malaria carrier came and he is positive for any parasite of malaria, we treat him uh, as soon as possible because if we let him carrying this parasite and moving from uh, one area to other area, he will be a source and the uh, mosquito, if it is present, can take this parasite and tr transmit it to other uh, to other uh, I mean recipient. If Dr. Um, Babar uh, have any other comment, Dr. Babar? Yes, uh, Assalamu alaikum Dr. Ibrahim, uh, I think you have covered it very nicely. Thank, thank you, you, thank you, Dr. Ibrahim. Uh, yes, Dr. Ibrahim, I think you have covered it very nicely. This is the approach that we have uh, all over the world, including in the uh, Kingdom of Saudi Arabia. Anyone positive should be treated as soon as possible because uh, the thing is that all types of mosquito are present here in Saudi Arabia, whether it be mosquito uh, anopheles or uh, Aedes aegypti. So any case, whether it be malaria or it be dengue or uh, God forbid yellow fever has to be treated as soon as possible. I think you have covered it very nicely. Thank you, Dr. Ibrahim. Okay, Dr. Baba. Okay, here is a question. I think this question from Sahar Mustafa, Dr. Roa, it was answered by Dr. Babar before, yeah. Can you repeat the question? Uh, again, just maybe she was not around. Uh, the same medication we are using, we can use for chronic patients. Uh, there is another question. Uh, Sahar Mustafa mentioned uh, she means the yellow fever. Is there any huh? vaccine that includes yellow fever and COVID-19 together? Um, to my knowledge, I don't know any vaccine containing uh, both, uh, I mean, both COVID, both uh, vaccine for COVID and for yellow fever. Okay, but why do you all put yellow fever with COVID? I don't think they will think like this. <laughs> yellow fever, one dose is enough yani, for lifelong. Yani. No need to take it even. Uh, so no need to put it with the yellow fever, yeah, with COVID. I don't think it is present. And I think scientifically it doesn't, uh, it doesn't make sense, really. 
great. Thanks a lot, Doctor. Uh, Doctor Ibrahim, maybe the uh, the questions is uh, is not formulated well. Maybe he, uh, she, or he asking about the yellow fever card, and we put for it. Uh, um, the, ah. <laughs> yes, reporting the COVID nineteen uh, vaccination. This is a common question now, and we know that a lot of uh, traveler are coming to the preventive office as well as to the travel clinic. Only, only traveler to uh, Philippines, Doctor. Philippines. Yes, to the Philippines. <laughs> and so we have. Maybe we have <laughs> maybe, maybe he's thinking like yeah, this. Yeah, maybe the question is like this. So, the so if he is part, if yeah. he is living here in the Eastern uh, province, I will refer him to preventive medicine. Inshallah, they will answer him. Okay, sorry. Thank you. Okay. <laughs> okay, I think we have here the last question. We'll take it. Uh, please, uh, any new trend to take a prophylaxis medication to malaria in uh, endemic area? I think this one uh, will be answered by Dr. Pavel in his uh, lecture. Uh, Dr. Pavel, I think this question will be uh, directed to you. Any one of the respected speaker, also you can uh, answer for sure. Is there any trend to take the medication to malaria? Yes, yes. Other inshallah, available. We are available. Can you repeat the question, please, Dr. Uh, yeah, for sure. It really, it's not uh, clear also for us. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, <laughs> some question is not clear really. Uh, can I read that maybe? Uh, please, sure. any uh, any new trend to take trend? He mean recommendation? He mean uh, to take prophylaxis medication to malaria in endemic area? I don't think there is a need for the people living in endemic area to take prophylaxis. But for the person coming from other country to endemic, uh, it is recommended uh, well to take a prophylaxis. I don't know if you have any comment, Dr. Babar. Maybe, uh, maybe he's asking about people living in endemic area. Is there any need to take a prophylaxis? Uh, it doesn't it's, make sense. Yes, Dr. Ibrahim, just like you mentioned, uh, if already living in an endemic area, most probably they have already suffered from malaria also. And, uh, and if that is the case, they would have taken the treatment on those, uh, already. So there is no yeah. prophylaxis, just like you mentioned, for anyone already living in the endemic area. But for example, if somebody from Saudi Arabia is going to an endemic area, obviously that traveler needs to be given the prophylactic treatment. Yeah, yeah, sure, sure, sure. Uh, most of our uh, customers in the traveling clinic, by the way, they are coming for uh, malaria prophylaxis. So my recommendation exactly. to all of my <laughs> colleagues, uh, to all of my colleagues working in traveling or in preventive medicine, is not to only, to only prescribe them medication. Please, 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 when you prescribe medication, sit with them and uh, give them the advice, what precaution should they take uh, regarding the not to make an activity outside, especially in uh, an endemic area with high load of the, of the uh, mosquito, to take repellent. Uh, I think it is, better than to give them a prophylaxis medication is to instruct them how to protect them, uh, their self uh, from uh, the mosquito to come to their body. This is, I yes. think this is the yes. most important. Uh, exactly, Dr. Ibrahim, totally agree. Uh, we are lucky to have here Dr. Amna with us in our, uh, as our manager and preventive department. The, the, just for the information of everybody, the policy that we are following is that we take the ID card of the traveler, whether it is a Saudi or a non-Saudi, we take a copy of the passport, we take his mobile number, we take his all details, mention very clearly where exactly he is traveling to. And uh, we, uh, we even ask him to uh, come to us for a post-travel uh, visit as well. And uh, this all information is maintained. Uh, I will, I'm sure all other preventive departments are also doing the same. So we have a record of all these patients with us and uh, we give them uh, complete health education and uh, maintain a record, uh, record of all these patients. If you allow me, Dr. Aru'a, I'm sorry uh, to, to uh, tell that I have to leave now. And my special thank really uh, to Dr. Aru'a, to Dr. Amina, and to Dr. Uh, Abu Abdul Aziz, uh, Dr. Saud, 
and to the people of preventive medicine in Jubail for their nice, nice organizing this uh, and for Dr. Ru'a, the leading of the organizing committee. Dr. Ahud also, Jazakum uh, Allah khair, Wallah yaqtikum al-afiyah. ونتمنى ان شاء الله انه بدايه خير للترافلينج كلينيك باذن الله تعالى والترافلينج ميديسين ان جنرال ان ذا ايسترن ريجن اند ان اول ذا ريجن اوف اور كانتري الله يعطيكم العافيه واي هاف تو ليف ونراكم على خير وجزاكم الله خير الله يعطيك العافيه دكتور ثانك يو Uh, thanks uh, again, Dr. Ibrahim. Uh, I think now we will, inshallah, proceed with uh, our uh, next speaker, inshallah, uh, Dr. Amin al-Rashidi, uh, who will present with us about, inshallah, meningitis and uh, travel. Uh, Dr. Amin, please proceed. السلام عليكم ورحمة الله وبركاته حابة أرحب فيكم في ثاني يوم للكونفرنس للترافل كلينيك as a health service and uh, as you know uh, as you can see in this uh, second day it is specifically for a special common diseases so we cover I think now almost uh, and special risks like pregnancy uh, now we will talk about the men and Meningitis and the travel. Uh, I will start this uh, by a question, uh, requesting this question and answer from you guys. When we pronounce a meningitis, always you will think about another term, meningococcal disease. So if there is any difference between these terms, the meningitis and the meningococcal disease, Can anyone share with uh, us uh, answer? I think for uh, your response, for uh, your response, my uh, dear audience. Any comments or feedback from you? There's one answer, meningitis no. is mm -hmm. Yes, I can see Muhammad Ba'abad. Meningitis is general, in general, okay. okay. Uh, Doctor, I'm going to ask you to repeat the question, please. Yeah, the question is, What is the, dif the, the difference between the meningitis and the meningococcal disease? When meningitis per se and the meningococcal disease. I can see one answer here if I'm um, in the track. Muhammad Abad, meningitis in general, is general. Good, good answer. Another two answers, Dr. Amino. Yeah, please. Can you proceed on it, Dr. Roa? Uh, meningococcal disease referred to illness caused by the Syria meningitis. Awesome. Yes. Okay. Most of the answer is the same. Meningococcal disease are caused by the Syria meningitis. Uh, another answer, meningitis is a pulmonary condition. It is caused by meningococcal mm -hmm. disease infection. Excellent, excellent. Good, good from you guys. So let's go move on to our lecture. So meningitis, meningitis can be caused by virus, bacteria, fungi, or other microorganisms. So when we say meningitis per se, means the inflammation caused by a lot of microorganisms. 
While meningococcal disease is the disease caused by bacteria known as Neisseria meningitis. And there are six major meningococcal serogroups associated with this disease. Serogroup A, B, C, W, X, and Y. How is meningitis or meningitis is transmit, transmit? Spread of the meningitis is by the respiratory secretion and it needs a required close contact. So you have to have a close contact to someone so you can, uh, uh, he can transmit the, menin, um, the disease for you. But both asymptomatic carriers and people with, uh, with overt meningococcal disease can serve as a source of infection. Asymptomatic carrier is a transient and typical effect, affect approximately 5%, 100% to 100% of the population at any given time. So sometimes your close contact is asymptomatic. So what is related to our travel clinic? The epidemiology of meningitis. If we know the epidemiology and we know the transmission, now we can prevent the meningitis. The epidemiology that Neisseria meningitis is found worldwide, but the highest incidence occur in the meningitis belt meningitis belt of sub-Saharan Africa. We will go through it in the next, um, all the countries for this meningitis belt. It's very interested, uh, interesting uh, terms also for the meningitis. Always you are thinking, if you are uh, pronouncing meningitis, you will think about meningococcal disease, then the meningitis belt. The meningococcal disease is hyper endemic to these regions. And periodic, there is a periodic epidemics in that region can occur during the dry seasons from December to June. And it can reach up to uh, 1,000 case per 100,000 population. It's very high rate. This is the meningitis built in sub saharan Africa. We can see very nice epidemiological map for the meningitis belt, show us that the meningitis belt is in Africa. It is in the middle of these kind, in the middle of Africa, showing a lot and a lot of a group of countries, starting from Eritrea, Ethiopia, till in the uh, Gambia and Senegal. So the meningitis belt country in Africa which we call it the sub-Saharan area, like Gambia, Senegal, Mali, Burkina Faso, Ghana, Niger, Nigeria also, Cameroon, Chad, Central African Republic, also Sudan, some areas, and South Sudan, and Uganda, Kenya, Ethiopia, Eritrea. A lot of travelers will come uh, during your clinic, asking about the also the prevention for meningitis, especially for these areas. We have a lot of people coming, going to Nigeria or Niger, Ghana, and Senegal also, and Chad. Of course, Sudan is one of them also, and Ethiopia, uh, Kenya also. By contrast, so we said the rate in the, it is a worldwide, but mainly in the meningitis belt, it is around, if there is uh, epidemics, uh, there is a, 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 a thousand per a hundred thousand. But in contrast, the rate of disease in United States, Europe, Australia, and South America, it ranges from only 0.12 to three cases per a hundred thousand population per year. What about Saudi Arabia? In Saudi Arabia, KSA citizen or resident, the highest accumulative incidence occurred between 1995 to 2011 was seen in children less than five years of age. And it's almost 12 cases per 100,000. 
while the accumulative incidence decreases with age. Like we have two cases per 100,000 from the age five years till 14 years. And approximately one case only per 1,000, 100,000 in age group like 15 to 64 and above 65 years age um, years. So there is a big difference between the rate of diseases in these different countries. Although meningococcal outbreak can occur anywhere in the world, they are most common in African, as we said, meningitis belt, and large scale epidemics occur every five to 12 years. So these countries are in danger every five to 12 years to have a large scale epidemics. Historically, outbreak in the meningitis belt were primarily due to what? Primarily due to the subgroup, uh, serogroup group A. However, with the introduction of monovalent serogroup group A as a meningococcal conjugated, uh, conjugated vaccine in that region started in 20, uh, 2010, recent meningococcal outbreak happened for other serotype. So in the meningitis belt and have primarily due to the serogroup group C and W. And although also, uh, although serogroup group X outbreak are also reported. So for the travel, the traveler, either they are coming from abroad from other countries to our country, all in Hajj and Umrah have increased the risk for meningococcal bacteria. And for a traveler from Saudi Arabia to that country is also we have to have, uh, they have a risk to have meningitis. What is the diagnosis? How do you diagnose meningococcal disease? Early diagnosis and treatment are very critical. A number of functions should be done to examine the cerebrospinal fluid and perform a gram stain. If possible, the lumbar puncture should be done before starting the antibiotic to ensure that the bacteria, if the present, can be cultured from the CSF. However, the lumbar puncture should not delay the antibiotic treatment. In general, diagnosis is made by to isolate the Neisseria meningitis, from, uh, from a normally sterile body site, as we said, like the blood or CSF, through culturing by detection, the Neisseria meningitis spe uh, specific nuclei acid by the PCR. What is the symptoms? If we go through the meningitis symptoms, it is an inflammation of meninges, dura, arachnoid, and biomatter. And the common symptoms for the meningitis is fever, headache, neck stiffness, and confusion. While other symptoms may include nausea, vomiting, and increased uh, sensitivity to light. This common symptoms is different, differ in children and infants, because may show different signs and symptoms, such as inactivity, irritability, vomiting and poor reflexes. This is very important information. Did meningitis have complication? Yes. The complication may be def 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 deafness, epilepsy, hydrocephalus, cognitive deficit, septicemia, including tiredness, vomiting, chills, severe ek, and fast breathing, and even death. Who's at risk to have a meningitis? This is very important. And here, our patient in the travel clinic is one of the risk factors to have meningitis. In general, age, the children have increased the risk. Group setting, especially in overcrowding area like college, campus, jail, certain medical condition, like patient with HIV or patient with CSF leak, 
or a patient not having a spleen. The second risk, the third risk factor, or the fourth, sorry, working with meningitis causing a pathogen, especially microbiologists. And the most important information for us is that travel. Travelers may be at increased risk if they are traveling to certain places, like we said, to Mecca and during Hajj and Umrah, or to the meningitis built in sub sahara Africa during the dry season from December to June. Regarding traveler concern, and this is related to our travel plan. Travelers visiting endemic area must take a precaution. So you have to give him this education. You have to communicate with him that now you have a risk because you are going to these countries. So you have to communicate with him, give him the health education and tell him avoiding crowded places, especially epidemic and endemic area. You have to use the mask and maintaining sanitation. Vaccination is the best means of prevention if the risk is high. How to treat a patient with meningitis? Because we are talking about the meningitis, so we have to cover the whole topic. Then we will go uh, specifically for the prevention and their vaccination. For treatment, meningococcal disease can be rapidly fatal and should always be viewed as a medical emergency. Antibiotic treatment must be started early in the course of the disease and empirically when sus suspected prior to the diagnostic test result, as we said before. And there is a several antibiotic choices are available, including the third generation cephalosporin. How to prevent now? As we said, ABC, prevention, uh, this message for all these infectious diseases. So one of them is the vaccine. Approximately seven to 10 days are required after you give him the vaccination. So this is very important information also. And this is the communication, the health education. Any traveler should come to a travel clinic or to the preventive office or to the infection, the infection control department in the hospital if there is not, there is, uh, the, the facility is not around in his region two to three weeks before traveling. This is very important like here in the vaccination of meningitis. We need, or he needs seven to 10 days after vaccination for the development of protective antibody levels. There is a routine immunization for children already. They covered, all the children are covered by the, the, uh, the Menectra or the vaccine for meningitis. And for a traveler, immunization is needed for who visit or reside in a part of Sub-Saharan Africa, Africa meningitis belt during the dry season from December to June, should receive the vaccination with a, a Menectra vaccine before travel, and it is one dose recommended before a travel, or to Hajj and Umrah. Meningitis vaccination, it is uh, the type of vaccine is conjugated, MCV4, Trade name is Menectra. Route of an, uh, administration is intramuscular. The dose is 0.5 milli. What is the safety of this vaccine and the adverse reaction? The low-grade fever and local reactions, such as injection site pain, arm swelling, and pain that limit movement of the injected arm are side effects effects seen after the, uh, the meningitis vaccine. Symptoms are generally mild to moderate and resolve within 48 to 72 hours. But severe adverse events such as high fever, chills, joint pain, rash, or seizures are rare 
and less than 5% of the vaccinees. What is the precaution and contraindication? People with moderate to severe acute illnesses should defer vaccination until their condition is improved. This is one. But it should be any moderate to severe acute illness. Vaccination is contraindicated for people who have a severe allergic reaction to any component of the vaccine. This is very important also. All meningococcal vaccine are inactive and may be given to immunosuppressed people. And this is a good news also. So don't worry about it. It's inactive vaccine. What about Umrah and Hajj? Travelers to the Kingdom of Saudi Arabia for Umrah or Hajj are required to provide documentation of a quadrivalent vaccine at least 10 days and no more than three years before arrival for uh, arrival for polysaccharide vaccine and no more than five years before arrival for conjugated vaccine. And visa requirement should be confirmed with the KSA embassy. So travel to Mecca during Hajj and Umrah, meningitis vaccine is required. What about the travelers or residents uh, of hyperendemic epidemic countries is administer a single dose to adult who travel to or reside in a country in which meningococcal disease is hyper epidemics, epidemic or ep uh, epidemic including the African meningitis belt. It is an urgent medical attention should be taken is essential for the meningitis. So summary for meningitis immunization for traveler. To put it in one slide, to put it as a summary for you guys, all travelers should either be vaccinated or should have a proof that they were vaccinated not more than three years ago. Traveler, uh, because sometimes in your travel clinic, you will have one traveler going to this uh, countries, but he was in Hajj last year. So خلاص, no need to give him. This is very important. Traveler coming to this, okay, Saudi Arabia for Umrah and Hajj are required to provide documentation of quadrivalent vaccine no more than three years or five years for the polysaccharide one. International traveler at high at risk of meningococcal disease who were previously vaccinated with a quadrivalent should be receiving a poster dose. This is very important also. If there is any antibiotic chemoprophylaxis for a traveler, antibiotic chemo is recommended for close contact of a patient with meningococcal disease to prevent secondary cases. So chemoprophylaxis is ideally should be initiated within 24 hours after the index, pa uh, index patient is identified. And this prophylaxis is given two weeks after exposure has little value. Antibiotic use for prophylaxis includes ciprofloxacin, rifampicin, and cefetriaxone. And the recommend, uh, which recommended for pregnant women is the cefetriaxone, is the one which is safe, inshallah, for pregnant women. So there is no antibiotic chemoprophylaxis for traveler. It's only for the close contact. If you want to give him a prophylaxis, it should be the vaccine. And of course, you have to give him, the traveler, this message. There is a further precaution for a traveler. Even with a vaccine of meningitis already taken, take the precaution. Practicing good personal hygiene, not sharing food, drink, catering, toothbrushes, lips balm, lip balms, or lipstick. Washing, washing the fruits and vegetables before eating, making sure food is thoroughly heated before eating. Thank you. I will give you some 
also important um, notes, information, just to summarize it for you. The spreading is through sneezing, coughing, or direct contact with a respiratory secretion with a close contact. The message for your traveler should be, take the respiratory hygiene etiquette with coughing and sneezing and avoid the overcrowded area, especially busy market and local transportation. Who is in general, generally at high risk? As we said, infant, young adult, and older people. So this is very important messages for your traveler. Thank you all. Dr. Aroa? Any question, please? Yes, Dr. Aam, thank you a lot for this uh, brief to the point uh, lecture about meningitis um, and travel. Uh, I don't know if you allowed me, Dr. Aam, uh, do you prefer to take the question for this lecture now or should we proceed to, uh, with the last lecture and take the question after that? Okay, good. Excellent, Dr. Excellent. Thank you. We will okay, proceed so with the last lecture. Yeah, we will uh, proceed to the next lecture, the last one for our uh, conference. Uh, okay, uh, our dear attendees and speaker, inshallah, we will proceed uh, to the last lecture uh, in our course today, inshallah, uh, which will be presented by Dr. Babin, inshallah, about the yellow fever disease and vaccine. After that, inshallah, we will uh, answer all questions and uh, the course will be inshallah, completed. Thank you for your patience. Bismillahirrahmanirrahim. Assalamu alaikum to everyone uh, once again. Uh, we'll start off with the last lecture uh, of this uh, workshop uh, which is, uh, regarding the. Uh, okay. Regarding yellow fever, uh, I'll start off with the infectious agent. The yellow fever virus is a single-stranded RNA virus that belongs to the genus uh, Flavivirus. Transmission of this vector, uh, of this disease, it is a vector-borne transmission uh, that occurs via primarily Aedes aegypti uh, mosquito by bite of an infected mosquito. As we discussed in malaria, in malaria, the name of the mosquito is Anopheles. Uh, in this case, it is Aedes aegypti. This virus may be transmitted from monkeys to humans or from human to human via these mosquitoes. Human infected with yellow fever virus experience the highest levels of viremia shortly before onset of fever and for the first three to five days of illness, during which time they can transmit the virus to the mosquitoes. Here in front of you is uh, an image of the Aedes aegypti mosquito. I would like to mention here that uh, this mosquito is double the size of an Anopheles mosquito. The other name for this mosquito, it is also known as tiger mosquito. Uh, why this name is given? Because uh, as you can see, the white spots, the white uh, marks that it has over its body are something like uh, similar to what a tiger has on its skin. Uh, so it's also known as the tiger mosquito. 
So two important things to remember about the Aedes uh, mosquito is that it is bigger in size, almost double in size as compared to Anopheles that causes malaria. And secondly, it has these white dots, white strips uh, on, its, uh, on its body. The epidemiology of yellow fever is that it occurs in sub-Saharan Africa and tropical South America, where it is endemic and intermittently even epidemic. In South America, yellow fever occurs most frequently in unammonized young men exposed to mosquito vectors through their work in forested areas. Okay, if we have a list of uh, countries with risk of yellow fever virus transmission in Africa. Uh, again, uh, the list is a long list of countries where uh, this disease is prevalent. You can see it's a long list, uh, which includes Angola, Benin, Cameroon. So the list is in front of us. Any traveler coming to our uh, clinic uh, and telling us that he intends to go to any of these countries, uh, obviously you will have to vaccinate him with the yellow fever vaccine. Uh, other than that, as I mentioned, there are countries in Central and South America as well where the disease is prevalent, which includes uh, Bolivia, Brazil, Colombia, Ecuador, France, Guiana, Guiana, Panama, Paraguay, Peru, Suriname, Trinidad and Tobago, and Venezuela. So any of the travelers uh, who's coming to us for uh, feedback or information, uh, you should be given Travelers should be given the yellow fever vaccine along with the yellow fever vaccination card, which I will discuss uh, subsequently in my lecture. Here is a map of Africa in front of us and uh, vaccine recommended in all those countries which are shown in yellow color. Uh, the other one are vaccine generally not recommended and vaccine not recommended. So basically uh, why I've shared this map in front of you, uh, we should have this uh, in our especially with travel clinics, any visitor uh, intend uh, uh, or showing desire to go to any of these countries uh, must be vaccinated with the yellow fever vaccine. And this is a map of uh, South uh, American continent. You can see the biggest country in uh, South American continent is Brazil. Uh, and all of it, uh, the yellow fever disease is prevalent there. Apart from this, uh, Bolivia, Paraguay, Peru, Colombia, Venezuela, all these countries, as you can see, uh, anyone visiting these countries should get the yellow fever vaccine. The southern part of South America, which includes uh, part of Chile and Argentina and the Falkland Islands, uh, the disease is uh, not uh, prevalent there and vaccination is not recommended if anyone is intending to go to Chile and Argentina. Risk for travelers, uh, a traveler's risk for acquiring yellow fever is determined by various factors. Just as I discussed for malaria also, it is not just one factor. It, it is a multiple uh, factorial issue, which uh, may include uh, immunization status of the traveler, uh, location of travel, where exactly the traveler intends to go, what is the season at that time when he's going, uh, how long will he be there, what is the duration of exposure, occupational and recreational activities that the traveler would be involved in, uh, local rate of transmission at that time, all these factors put together, uh, ultimately this is what will uh, you know, determine uh, all the risk factors. Yellow fever virus transmission in rural West Africa is seasonal with an elevated risk during the end of the rainy season and the beginning of the dry season, which is usually uh, starting from July till uh, October. Uh, while on the other hand, the risk of infection in South America is highest during the rainy season. The rainy season in South America is different. It's, uh, it's from January to May with a peak incidence uh, from February uh, and March. From 1970 through 2015, uh, a total of 11 cases of yellow fever were reported in travelers from the United States and Europe who traveled to West Africa. So out of these 11 cases, uh, six were from uh, who visited West Africa and five cases uh, were those who traveled to South America. Eight of the 11 travelers, uh, very uh, any, uh, unfortunately, 73% uh, of them uh, died. 
only one traveler had a documented history of yellow fever vaccination and that uh, traveler or that patient, he survived. So this is how important it is. Uh, it's, it's, these diseases are not to be taken lightly at all. And uh, anyone visiting these countries uh, must be, must be uh, vaccinated with the yellow fever vaccine. The risk of acquiring yellow fever during travel is difficult to predict because of variations in ecologic uh, determinants of uh, virus transmission. For a two week stay, the estimated risks for illness and for death due to yellow fever for an unvaccinated traveler visiting an endemic area are as follows. If the visitor is going to West Africa, the chances of him uh, getting ill will be almost 50 cases per 100,000 travelers and uh, 10 deaths per 100,000. This is for West Africa. And for those uh, intending to go to visit any countries in South America, the list of which I've already mentioned before, uh, five out of 100,000 will most likely get ill and one out of 100,000 can unfortunately even die, if not vaccinated, obviously. What will be the clinical presentation of uh, yellow fever? Most people infected with yellow fever virus uh, likely do not seek medical attention because they have minimal or no symptoms. For people who develop symptomatic illness, the incubation period is typically three to six days. The initial illness is nonspecific, uh, characterized by fever, chills, headache, backache, myalgia, prostration, nausea, and vomiting. Most patients improve after the initial presentation. After a brief remission of up to 24 hours, approximately 12% of those infected progress to a more serious form of the disease, which is characterized by jaundice. Obviously, the name yellow fever, jaundice has to be there. Uh, if further it aggravates, there can be hemorrhagic symptoms. Uh, which will lead to shock and multi-organ failure and death as well. The case fatality ratio of severe cases is 30 to 60 percent. So it's a highly, highly dangerous disease with a high mortality rate, 30 to 60 percent case fatality ratio. I've shown this uh, diagram here that uh, this very uh, benign looking mosquito can really cause a dangerous disease, uh, yellow fever. And you can see the yellow colored eyes, jaundiced eyes of this uh, unfortunate patient. How will we diagnose it? Yellow fever infection is diagnosed based on laboratory testing, a person's symptoms and travel history. Travel history is obviously very important. It will give us a clue. And laboratory diagnosis is best performed by virus isolation or nucleic acid amplification tests performed early in the illness for yellow fever virus or yellow fever virus, viral RF. Treatment, unfortunately, there is no specific medi medication for uh, yellow fever to treat yellow fever infection. Treatment is directed at symptomatic relief or life-saving interventions. Rest, uh, fluids, and use of analgesics and antipyretics may relieve symptoms of uh, itching, and, itching and fever. Care should be taken to avoid medications such as aspirin or non-steroidal anti-inflammatory drugs, which may increase the risk of bleeding. Already there is a tendency, there is a possibility of hemorrhage. And on top of that, if uh, by mistake or uh, due to whatever reason, aspirin or non-steroidal anti-inflammatory drugs are given, there is a more likelihood, more possibility of more bleeding, further aggravating this situation in which the patient would already be in. Infected people should be protected from further mosquito exposure by staying indoors or under a mosquito net during the first few days of illness so they do not contribute to the transmission of the cycle. Uh, before uh, starting off with the preventive strategies, obviously, which are very, very important, I would just like to ask a question here that uh, to all the uh, Honorable, uh, honorable uh, participants who are listening to me. What is the missing link? Alhamdulillah, in Saudi Arabia and Middle East, we uh, do not have yellow fever. What is the missing link? Why do we not have yellow fever uh, in Saudi Arabia, despite the fact that uh, we have the Aedes mosquito here, 
and uh, the temperature environmental conditions are also the same what is the missing link why don't we have yellow fever for example in saudi arabia can anyone answer this question please putra roa yes dr papar yes my question is what is the missing link why uh, my 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 question is to all the honorable participants uh, listening listening to me now what is the missing link uh, we have uh, across the red sea in africa we have yellow fever and on this side of the red sea uh, we have saudi arabia the same environment is there the aedes aegypti mosquito is here what is the missing link why don't we have the uh, yellow fever here Here, waiting for the response from participants first. Uh, one of the answer was uh, because the majority stayed indoor. Okay, okay. This can also be one of the reasons, but I think most of us in Saudi Arabia, we are traveling and moving around morning, evening. Mm -hmm. We are traveling everywhere. I think uh, we can further uh, improve this answer further. Okay, another answer. Protective measures are better. Protective measures are also better. Uh, thank you for this answer. Also, uh, I, the missing link. My my question is, what is the missing link? The missing link is the virus itself. We don't have the the virus here. Okay, that is. It is all the very important that anyone traveling from Saudi Arabia to any of these countries must be vaccinated. because he may go there acquire the virus come back to saudi arabia with the virus in his blood and we have the mosquito here the aedes mosquito is here even if one case coming back from african countries where virus is prevalent brings it back to saudi arabia gets bitten by a mosquito aedes mosquito for example got forbid in jubail or in any part of saudi arabia now this mosquito has the virus in him which initially he did not have right so this mosquito can bite 1 2 3 4 as many people as possible and spread on the infection the missing link is the virus itself this virus is only prevalent in the endemic areas okay so this is the answer to this question please yeah. so that is why prevention is very important that is why vaccination is very important not only that even you know the ships coming from these african countries once they uh, once they they, they are uh, you know on the berths in uh, jadda or any other port of saudi arabia there are proper fumigation measures to make sure that maybe there is a mosquito you know mosquito as a traveler coming from these countries to 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 saudi arabia so fumigation measures are very important to make sure that uh, if there is any such mosquito they can be killed also in short the missing link is the virus itself thank you thank you for your participation let's move on with the preventive measures personal protective measures the best way to prevent mosquito borne diseases include yellow fever is to avoid mosquito bites uh, avoid visiting outbreak areas wherever there is a outbreak uh, the the traveler should be advised better not to go there if still he or she has to go there wear appropriate clothing bed nets insecticides and repellents are to be used need not to mention obviously uh, vaccination has already been done for self protection uh dr babar i think there is one answer only if you allow me to mention it uh they mentioned here because the less rain which causes stagnant water and good drain and protective measures against the mosquito Yes. Okay. Okay. Yeah. This is also good. Good. Thank you. Thank you for this answer. Continue, please, with the vaccine. Because of the risk of serious adverse events after yellow fever vaccination, clinicians should only vaccinate people who are at risk of exposure to yellow fever virus, or who require proof of vaccination to enter a country. To minimize further the risk of serious adverse events. clinicians should carefully observe the contraindications and consider the precautions to vaccination before administering the yellow fever vaccine vaccine administration for all eligible people a single dose 0.5 ml injection uh, of reconstituted 
treated vaccine should be administered subcutaneously. So if it is being administered subcutaneously, we all understand that it is a live vaccine. In 2014, the WHO Strategic Advisory Group of Experts on Immunization concluded that a single primary dose of yellow fever vaccine provides sustained immunity and lifelong protection against yellow fever disease and that a booster dose is not needed. So we are very lucky here, alhamdulillah, that even if once a person, only once in his life, is given the yellow fever vaccine, it is enough to give him protection against yellow fever for the rest of his life, lifelong protection. Uh, how can we prevent it? You can prevent yellow fever by using insect repellent and other methods to repel mosquitoes. There is also a vaccine that can prevent you from yellow fever for 10 years, even lifelong as per WHO now. Common adverse reactions of this vaccine are generally mild. However, 10 to 30% reported mild systemic adverse events, including low-grade fever, headache, and myalgia that begins within days after vaccination and lasts for 5 to 10 days. Severe adverse effects uh, are very, very rare, but unfortunately, they do happen. Hypersensitivity, immediate hypersensitivity reactions characterized by rash, urticaria, or bronchospasm are uncommon. Anaphylaxis after yellow fever vaccine is reported to occur at a rate of 1.3 cases per 100,000 doses administered. Even more rare is the yellow fever vaccine associated neurological disease, which represents as a combination of clinical syndromes, including meningoencephalitis, Guillain-Barre syndrome, acute disseminated encephalomyelitis, and rarely cranial nerve palsies. Another serious but very, very rare adverse reaction is the yellow fever vaccine associated visotropic disease. Uh, this is a severe illness similar to wild type of yellow fever disease with virus, vaccine virus proliferating in multiple organs and often leading to multi-organ dysfunction or failure and occasionally death also. Since the initial cases of uh, this vaccine-associated visotropic disease were published in 2001, more than 100 confirmed and suspected cases have been reported throughout the world. Contraindications for the yellow fever vaccine uh, to receive yellow fever vaccine include if the age of the child is less than six months, there is some previous hypersensitivity to vaccine components, and various forms of altered immunity, including symptomatic HIV infections. Precautions that are to be taken before giving the vaccine, if travel to a yellow fever risk area is unavoidable for a person with a precaution to vaccination, the decision to vaccinate should balance the risks of the yellow fever virus exposure with the risk of for an adverse event after vaccination. If international travel requirements are the only reason to vaccinate a person with a precaution to vaccination, uh, the person should not be immunized and should be issued a medical waiver to fulfill health regulations. Further precautions uh, to receiving yellow fever vaccine include age 6 to 8 months, age more than 60 years, asymptomatic HIV infection with moderate immunosuppression, pregnancy and breastfeeding. So these are all those conditions in which even more precautions should be taken uh, before giving the yellow fever vaccine. Simultaneous administration of other vaccines and drugs, I think has already been discussed very thoroughly by Dr. Asafa and Dr. Amna also, even Dr. Ibrahim also discussed this issue. No evidence exists that inactivated vaccines interfere with the immune response to yellow fever vaccine. I've mentioned before already that yellow fever is a live vaccine. So inactivated vaccines uh, will, make, uh, will not interfere with the immune response. Therefore, inactivated vaccines can be administered either simultaneously or at any time before or after the yellow fever vaccine. It is recommended that yellow fever vaccine be given at the same time as other live vi uh, viral vaccines. Otherwise, the clinician should wait 30 days between vaccinations as the immune response to a live viral vaccine might be impaired if administered within 30 days of another live virus vaccine.
international certificate of vaccination or prophylaxis icvp international health regulation allow countries to provide a proof of yellow fever vaccination documented on a icvp as a condition of entry for travelers arriving from certain countries even if only in transit to prevent importation and indigenous transmission of yellow fever Travelers who are arriving without proof of yellow fever vaccination or a medical waiver to a country that has a yellow fever vaccination entry requirement may be quarantined for up to six days. They may even be refused entry or vaccinated on site. Uh, I would like to share my personal experience here working in the travel clinic. The important thing to remember here uh, to all the honorable listeners is that once you give the yellow fever vaccine, it becomes effective after a period of 10 days. So during this 10 days, the traveler should not travel because if he reaches his, uh, his country or destination, wherever he is going, and 10 days have still not passed from the time he took the vaccine, he may even have to be quarantined at the airport because the vaccine, once given, will take full effect only after 10 days. Yes, it will give you lifelong protection, but for the initial 10 days, you are still, even despite having taken the vaccine, you are still not uh, covered. You are still not immune. So uh, once we issue you a yellow fever card after giving the traveler the, 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 the vaccine, we clearly mention the date on it. Okay, And this date on the card will be seen by the airport authorities uh, to the place where you are going. And if 10 days have not passed, you will be asked as a traveler to remain quarantined at the airport, finish that duration of 10 days, and only then would you be allowed to go out of the airport. So this is, again, a very, very important point that the traveler has to be informed about. This is just an example of the certificate of vaccination or prophylaxis. As you can see here, uh, we will mention the name of the vaccine, yellow fever vaccine, and date is uh, mentioned here on this card is 15 June 2018. So if the date is the date of giving the vaccine was 15 June, the traveler should wait for another 10 days, which means that he can either go on 24th or 25th of June, he can start his journey and reach the place of his destination. If 10 days have not passed, they will ask him to be quarantined on the airport till this 10 days are finished. Countries uh, that require proof of yellow fever vaccination from all arriving travelers. This is a very important list, which we all have uh, in our travel clinics, which we all doctors should have. And this information must be given to any traveler who uh, intends to go to any of these countries, which are mentioned here. All these countries require a proof that on arrival, you have the yellow fever vaccination card with you clearly mentioning the date when you took this vaccine. Otherwise, either you will be uh, deported, asked to go back, maybe you will ask to be quarantined, or you will be vaccinated on site. I thank you all once again for your patience, and uh, thank you very much. Um, last, uh, just the last comment is that large epidemics of yellow fever occur. I mentioned in my lecture that sometimes epidemics of yellow fever occur. So just uh, a little bit detail about the epidemic. Large epidemics of yellow fever occur when infected people introduce the virus into heavy populated areas with high mosquito density and where most people have little or no immunity due to the lack of the vaccination. Aedes aegypti bites primarily during the day. This species is most active two hours after sunrise and several hours after sunset. So here again, there is a difference, you know. It is Egypti is generally biting during the day, while Anopheles prefer to bite during the night, which cause uh, the malaria. Thank you very much. God bless you all. Thanks a lot, Dr. Babe, for this uh, informative and great uh, lecture. Thank you, Dr. Dr. Thank you, Dr. Uh, by the end of this lecture, uh, we will conclude uh, our course now. Uh, Dr. Amna, please uh, take the read. ايوه السلام عليكم ورحمه الله وبركاته بس في نقطه نضيفها بالنسبه لليالو فيفر في جايدلاينز جديد والجايد لاين هذا فروم ام او اتش انه اونلي تو ا ترافلر فور فيليبين 
a traveler from Philippines, we have to initiate the yellow card for them uh, to um, report all the vaccination for COVID-19. Philippines as a country is no uh, prevention for it for the yellow fever vaccine. But we will use the same yellow card, and we call it now as a yellow card vaccination record. And we will just report the COVID-19, all the COVID-19 that this person is taking it in Saudi Arabia. And we will write it by handwriting and stamp it very clearly. And we will write his name clearly. This is very important. And this is a recent guideline for any traveler to uh, Philippines. So just to add this for lecture for Dr. Uh, Baber. This is regarding the uh, yellow fever and our, uh, if there is any question, Dr. Uh, Dr. Roa. Or we can... uh, well, thank you for this uh, great addition, Dr. Amina. Uh, I will give uh, the audience a chance to post their question if they have any question. Uh, I will start with the previous question uh, from previous lecture for Dr. Amina. Uh, Dr. Amina, the question said, how much uh, should we isolate the patient with suspected meningitis? It should be isolated in the hospital. Uh, it is a critical emergency um, disease. It should be isolated in the hospital until the diagnosis is there. Uh, and mostly, how much is the duration of, other, of the isolation, Dr. It depends on the diagnosis time. It depends on the diagnosis. Okay. Good. Great. Uh, and usually these diagnoses will be uh, within uh, two to three days. Great, great. Thank you, Doctor, for this uh, answer. Uh, the second question is uh, how to differentiate between uh, dengue and uh, yellow fever, dengue fever and yellow fever, since they have the same sign and symptoms. Thank you, Dr. Roa, for this question. The answer to this question is uh, distinguished, obviously, through the through the clinical uh, clinical as well as through the laboratory diagnosis. Laboratory is always there to help us, and they will give uh, give us a very very clear uh, diagnosis. We have a lot of cases of uh, dengue reported uh, in different parts of uh, of the kingdom. Uh, generally, uh, people coming from India, there was an outbreak there. Uh, and all these cases are diagnosed through through the laboratory. The, the laboratory is always there to help us. They give us a very, very clear cut diagnosis as to what is happening. As far as uh, the clinical diagnosis is confirmed, concerned, both of them, dengue as well as yellow fever, there is hemorrhage, there is, uh, there is uh, chances of uh, particular, uh, particular uh, hemorrhages, especially in case of dengue. Uh, jaundice is present in both of them. But we will not rely only on the clinical diagnosis. We will rely on the confirmed laboratory diagnosis. Can I add uh, an uh, answer, Dr. Roja, regarding these questions? This is the, uh, the uh, importance of post-travel clinic, the post-travel care in a post-travel clinic or in the emergency of the hospitals. You know, a patient who coming to you with a fever of unknown origin and he have sign of hemorrhagic uh, diseases, so this is, you have to have all these differential diagnoses in your mind. Then you have to uh, identify the organism according to the uh, investigation. So this is very important, a question for the post-travel uh, care. Okay, good. Uh, so uh, Dr. Rababar, uh, uh, give us this information that clinically they are the same, but when you Go, uh, think about it, you have to think about what is the destination. This uh, patient is coming from uh, which area? This is very important to make it uh, in your mind, in the higher in the list. Okay? It's very important to have the full information regarding the trip. Thank you. Uh, thank you, Dr. Amina, for answering this question. Uh, another question here is, uh, what is the incidence of uh, yellow fever in uh, case A, Saudi Arabia? Uh, there is no case of yellow fever, alhamdulillah, reported in KSA. Okay. Even if a single case is uh, reported, it, will be, uh, it, it, it would have reper uh, repercussions and it would have to be immediately, urgently uh, informed to 
authorities. Zero, zero prevalence, alhamdulillah, of uh, yellow fever inside the kingdom. But as I mentioned in my previous answer, we do have cases of uh, dengue fever. Uh, recently, there was an outbreak in India and appropriate uh, measures were taken, treatment was given, preventive precautions were done. So the answer to the question for yellow fever is, is uh, zero, but yes, for dengue fever, we had certain cases. Great, 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 uh, Dr. Babur. Uh, another uh -huh. question to you, Dr. Babur. Uh, please, uh, how many poster dose of yellow fever vaccine are needed after the first dose? No, there is, uh, there is no uh, need for a booster uh, dose. Only one single dose, the 17D vaccine, the name of the vaccine, is enough to give lifelong protection. One dose. Enough. Generally, uh, some uh, literature says 10 years. Now it has been uh, confirmed okay. that it is giving lifelong protection. Just one injection is enough to give life, lifelong protection. No need of a booster dose, please. Thank you. Thank you, Doctor. Uh, Dr. Amna, I think this question for you related for the previous question about the isolation of uh, patients. Uh, now uh, the audience is asking about uh, family or contact. Yeah, for the contact, as soon as possible, if they, the hospital, is suspect a case of meningitis and still the diagnosis is not there, but all the clinical uh, presentation is in this, in this patient as index case, usually they will send the notification to the preventive office and we will do all the preventive measures. One of these measures is to uh, trace the contact and we will give them the chemo prophylaxis. As possible. There is no delay for it also. And it should be a ciprofloxacin or uh, sometimes azithromycin as one single dose. Thank you. Uh, Victoria, you also asked a question about Neisseria meningitis. Uh, uh, is PCR available here? Yes. Or yes, it's available. The diagnosis is here. Another question, uh, he said, so no travel or return back to Philippines without updated yellow card. If no yellow card, uh, does the patient uh, enter to the quarantine? Uh, can you repeat the question, please, Dr. Roa? Uh, he's asking here uh, if, uh, if there is no travel or return back to Philippines without updated yellow card. If he, uh, for example, missed the yellow card or... Uh, he doesn't have it with him. Yeah, sometimes they will just uh, stop him there in the airport. This is what happened for a lot of a traveler in the Philippines. Have this uh, the first time a lot of uh, traveler came to us. They said we pass there to Philippines. They make us uh, stop there. They not allow us to go to the uh, to the country. So this is very important. And I think now the embassy of the Philippines is asking all people who are going to Philippines to initiate this yellow fever card. It is a yellow card, sorry. We cannot say it's a yellow fever now. Okay, great, thank you, Victoria Ami. Thank you. Maybe, okay, here another question. هل الحمى الصفراء دكتورة ممكن الوقاية منها باستخدام اللقاح زي الملاريا؟ طبعا الحمى الصفراء اللقاحة موجود يلو فيفر فاكسين this is what we talk about in the lecture so it should be by a vaccination of course other precaution can be measure can be taken but the yellow vaccine you cannot enter these countries especially the, the I think the Dr. Baber show your the maps these countries not allow you to take a visa for them unless the yellow card is there you cannot enter these countries. This is an international guideline before the COVID-19. And now there is an international guideline for the COVID-19 vaccine. Great, great. A great, Dr. Amni, thank you. Thank you. Uh, thank you. There is uh, another question, if you allow me. Does the yellow yeah, fever sure, sure, sure. Uh, provide herd immunity? Uh, herd immunity in relation to yellow vaccine. Does the yellow vaccine provide the herd immunity? Herd immunity, uh, if, uh, if, the, if the population of the area, more than uh, two-thirds of uh, the population has been given the vaccine, uh, we believe that uh, herd immunity is there. So in 
endemic areas only in countries where yellow fever is prevalent if uh, two third of the population uh, would be vaccinated yes herd immunity for any disease for example even for polio or for any other disease will be there that does not mean that a traveler going from yes. a non endemic area will not take the vaccine important point is that anyone for example i again give the example of saudi arabia because we are sitting in saudi arabia anyone from Saudi Arabia going to a country where even there is herd immunity and the yellow fever is endemic there, still he or she has to be vaccinated with the yellow fever vaccine and must have a proof that he or she got the yellow fever vaccine by showing the yellow fever vaccination card. Great, great. Uh, okay, I think this is uh, the last question here. Uh, is there any need for vaccination for yellow fever after being infected? Sorry, again, again. Sorry. Uh, is there any need for vaccination for yellow fever after being infected? No, yellow fever vaccine is given once only, as I, as I mentioned in my lecture also and during this question answer session also. Yellow fever vaccine is to be given only once. It gives you lifelong protection. No need to give the vaccine again. If infected, uh, the treatment I mentioned, it's a symptomatic treatment. Symptomatic treatment would be done. But generally, a patient or a traveler who has taken the yellow fever vaccine is, is highly, highly protected. There is a very, very less likelihood of him or her getting infected. Okay. Thanks a lot, Dr. Uh, Babi, for uh, this answer. Most welcome. Uh, I think this was the last question. Uh, if you allow me, uh, dear audience and uh, speaker, I will uh, answer a couple of questions. Uh, send it to me uh, multiple times. It is uh, not related to the course, but related to the CME hour and attendance. Uh, sure, sure. Uh, just for all uh, attendance, the attendance, inshallah, will be electronic. Since you uh, register on the site online and attend uh, the Zoom, uh, automatically your uh, name will be uh, recorded. This is the first question about attendance. Uh, the second one about the CME hours, uh, target audience and uh, at which time we will enter it. Uh, please, uh, I will ask you uh, kindly uh, to check the main poster. If you are from the target audience in the main poster for this uh, course, inshallah, you will get the hour. But if you are not from uh, the target audience, which is in the main poster, uh, I'm sorry to say, uh, I will not guarantee to get uh, the hour for the course. Uh, the third one, uh, what is the expected uh, time to get uh, this hour? Uh, usually we will rise it through months, inshallah, usually take uh, three weeks to four weeks until you find it, inshallah, in your account in uh, Mumaris. Uh, hopefully, I will uh, I answer all the repeated questions regarding uh, this point. Uh, we will see if we have any other question. And after that, we will conclude for today, inshallah. Uh, there is the last question here, Doctora. Uh, is it required to take the vaccine for yellow fever even if we will not travel? No. No requirement at no all. No requirement at all. Uh, OK. Yes, only in case of the travel to these countries. And I told you before, these embassy, they will not initiate visa for you, like in Hajj and Umrah. They will not initiate visa for you for these countries unless you have proven that documentation that you have been taken the vaccine, yellow fever vaccine, and it should be two weeks before traveling. Other than that, yellow fever cannot be given to anyone. And it is not given to the general population. Thank you. Thank For us you. in a preventive office, it is one of the biggest <laughs> in our uh, vaccination uh, list. Allah yafiq malafiq, Doctor. Allah yafiq malafiq. Allah yafiq. Allah yafiq. Ah, wa shukran jazeera lakin, Doctor. بعد إذنكم بس في بعض الردود بيسألون نرد عليهم بالعالم بخصوص الساعات حرجع تاني بس yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah sure 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 take your time دكتور بالنسبة لوضع الحضور المسجلين أونلاين وحضروا الزوم أوتوماتيك لأسماءهم بتسجل بإذن الله إلكتروني هترفع الأسماء يحتسب لهم الحضور بالنسبة للساعات إذا كنت من الفئات المستهدفة الموجودة على البوستر الأساسي للكورس بحول الله وقوته 
حتى تسجل لك الساعات لكن اذا ما كنت من الفئات المستهدفه فانا اتاسف انه احتمال كبير انه ما يكون في اضافه للساعات لك تمام آه، مثل الوقت المتوقع لتسجيل الساعات في حساب ممارس احنا بنرفعها للهيئه غالبا تاخذ لها تقريبا ثلاث اسابيع الى اربع اسابيع باذن الله وبعد كده تنزل في اكونت الممارس بالممارس الصحي تمام اتمنى ان شاء الله انه اجدتكم على الاسئله uh, hopefully you enjoy with us uh, during the previous uh, two day journey We explore together uh, and shine light on a uh, very important uh, point related to travel medicine. Actually, thank you, Dr. Amna, for uh, this uh, very interested uh, course. Uh, please take the lead to conclude with us, Dr. Amina. طبعا الحمد لله حمدا كثيرا والصلاة والسلام على أشرف المرسلين سيدنا محمد صلى الله عليه وسلم. الشكر الأول طبعا لله سبحانه وتعالى. أشكر كل الحضور على هذا الاهتمام في الموضوع. Um, I express my gratitude to Dr. Saoud Al-Matrafi and Dr. Ahud Al-Ghamdi for their constant and massive support during the planning and preparation and smooth conduction of the Travel Clinic uh, Conference in Jubail Health Network. And it is um, uh, the first one in the whole uh, kingdom. And also, I express my thanks to you, Doctora, the Medical Education Affairs Department, the head of the Medical Education Affairs Department and Jubail Health Network, Doctora Ro Al Musa, for her vital support and guidance during the entire process of arranging and conducting this conference. My profound gratitude to all the speakers, Doctor Suwar, Doctor Re, Doctora Reem, Doctora Safa. Dr. Sumaya, as well as Dr. Ibrahim, in their excellent, informative, and brilliant lecture. The support of Dr. Ibrahim Zahrani from the cluster is highly, highly appreciated. Last but not the least, um, I want to appreciate the team that working on this uh, conference, me and my colleague, Dr. Baber, in the Jubail Preventive Department for our effort, dedication, and the hard work through all the planning and the approval, recognition by the Saudi Council. Alhamdulillah, and I thank the guests, honestly, a great guest, a great guest, a great guest, a great كان الحضور متفاعل معنا كثير أشكرهم كثيرا وإن شاء الله بإذن الله وبحول الله وقوته إنه إن شاء الله راح يكون في لقاء آخر معهم في هذه الكونفرنس وأعتقد إنه المشاركين إنه يتجاوز الثلاث آلاف أو أكثر من كذا هو دليل على إنه الموضوع هذا مهم دليل على إنه The travel clinic as a health service is needed, is a must, especially in the pandemic COVID-19. So it is uh, one of the preventive way to prevent all these infectious diseases as well as the environmental hazards, as well as the uh, personal safety. We go through it in a journey. First day was in uh, what is a clinic, what is a travel clinic, and uh, what is the policy behind it? What is the guideline behind it? Then we go through the, uh, the risk assessment, how you manage this, the risk, how you say that this is a risk for this patient and it should be personalized for individualized for the patients, as well as we go through the prophylaxis management in general and emphasizing on the most important diseases and the vaccination, which is a, a very important topic, especially nowadays, as we said, especially with the, uh, the vaccination is now di uh, directed to the elderly people, to the adult, not only the children. So now there is a new era, a new uh, uh, guideline for the adult vaccination. And Dr. Uh, uh, we cover it in a special uh, lecture as well as we cover the 
uh, special diseases like travel for diarrhea traveler and sexually transmitted diseases, COVID-19, airborne diseases, malaria, meningitis, yellow fever. Inshallah, we cover a lot with the high risk in the pregnancy, a lot of the uh, important topic, common topics. And uh, I hope that you gain a lot of information and we are uh, here to help you. And inshallah, we are just communicate this information, knowledge between us uh, to improve all the health services in Saudi Arabia as one of the vision of a 2030. Inshallah, we will have it inshallah again and again. And uh, thank you all. Thank you, Dr. Aroa. Thank you. Uh, for those who are interested to get uh, the YouTube link for uh, today and uh, yesterday, uh, you will find it in the chat box, please. You can find the record for uh, today and uh, for yesterday. Okay, thank you for all audience. Uh, hopefully you have a nice and wonderful day from now, inshallah.